In this video, we want to start taking a look at components and how we can use components alongside variables. So if we click on the cube, we've already taken a look at the transform component, but we also have other items. We wouldn't normally mess with the mesh filter. All right, this is basically what defines its 3D object as a cube. We, we really wouldn't want to change that. But we do have a mesh renderer that has options for material, which is the overall material for the object. And I set this back to default. So if yours is still orange, don't worry, that's perfectly fine. I did that uh, on purpose. Uh, we also have things like lighting, whether it can receive or cast shadows. Um, so you'll notice shadows kind of disappear when you do that. Uh, we've got things about probes, we'll get into those later. Additional settings per object motion, we don't need to worry about this. What we're really interested in is the materials, which basically defines its material down here, this basic shader. And we can change this at runtime. So we'll take a look at some of that. We've also got, for example, the box collider. So if I just uh, leave the gizmos on, but switch off the mesh renderer, we can obviously see the box collider right there in green. So we can, for example, manipulate this directly inside the script. We also have a rigid body. We can manipulate this. Even the script is considered an attribute or a component rather um, that we can then manipulate in script. So let's start with mesh renderer. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to write a new script for this. So in the scripts folder, right click, create C sharp script. And I'll call this um, component test for this to update there we go okay so first of all I want to add this as a component so it's a it's an, a renderer so it's going to be a public of type renderer that I will call uh, simply call it my renderer let's call it not very creative name, but it will work. Okay, let's just save this. Uh, so on the cubes, let's just get rid of this object variable script. Let's right click and remove that component. Same on cube one, right click and remove. Okay, um, and then we can add the uh, component test script to both of these. Great, so now we can see that we've got a little slot that is accepting a renderer, which is right up here. Okay, so I could actually drag that mesh renderer directly into there, and it's actually picked up on it, which allows me then to talk to that. Uh, same on here, okay. Or if I wanted, I could even drag in cube, and it will automatically recognize the object and get its mesh renderer directly from it. So I can talk to other objects and change their mesh renderers. Okay, but at the moment I just want to change their own. Um, let's also do the same with box collider and rigid body. Okay, so uh, public of type collider, and you'll notice that you get either a collider or a collider 2D. Uh, so Collider is 3D, Collider 2D is two, for 2D games. They, re, uh, they react very differently. So make sure you choose just Collider. Uh, and let's just call it my Collider. And then public of type rigid body. And once again, you get a rigid body 3D, a rigid body 2D. So make sure you're using the 3D one. And I'll call it my RB, as in like rigid body. So I don't really want to type rigid body too many times. <laughs> it's quite a big word. Okay, and now you'll notice we've got some slots. So once again, a box collider will easily go into the collider slot and the rigid body will easily go into the rigid body slot. And we can obviously mix and match. So you could take it from a different object, which is perfectly fine. But I'm going to keep this simple at the moment by just affecting the ones that are on the object with the scripts. Okay, so let's first of all take a look at how can we actually swap out a material. So let's go into materials and let's create a new material. 
right click create material let's call this one uh, what shall I call it uh, let's let's do a green on this one so I just want to choose just a standard kind of green color all the way up into the top right and drag the smoothness all the way down to the bottom all right so we've got our material uh, so to actually swap out the material we need access to that material in the script which means we're going to need a public of type material and I'll call this one uh, green or green mat save that so now you'll notice we've got a new empty slot and we can drag this in from the actual project window itself so it doesn't have to even belong in the hierarchy we can drag this in and it knows now to access that green material okay so now in the script let's say in the update we're going to do an input again so we're going to say if input dot get mouse button down and we'll use the left mouse button then we're going to talk to the renderer and make it material the green mat okay so we're going to say my renderer dot material equals green mat and that's how easy it is to change an object's material during runtime all right so a lot of this is very kind of easy very basic try it so both of these should turn green when we left click there we go all right and it's instantly changed their material to the green which you can see down there on the bottom we can see that it's automatically placed that in the slot there okay um, let's do something for example with the box collider at the moment it's set on the trigger let's make it not a trigger So we can access the my collider dot is trigger equals false. So that's how you can switch a trigger on or off. Save. And for this one, we'll, we'll most likely need to keep an eye on our inspector. So I'm just going to lock that. We're going to watch that little checkbox. So as I press play and I left click, there we go. It's no longer a trigger. That's disappeared what if we wanted to change a material on this object so at the moment it's set on bouncy so if we're going to physics materials let's right click create a new physic material let's call this heavy just unlock my inspector so let's say dynamic friction is zero Static friction is zero and bounciness is zero. So that's a very, very heavy material. It's definitely not going to bounce. So very much like what we did with the actual material, we need access to what we want to change. So we're going to say public physic material. And let's call it, uh, well, let's call it heavy. Um, and I'll call it a P mat so that we know that it's a physics material. So once again, if we input, we can say uh, my collider dot material equals heavy mat, heavy P mat rather. And that will then change that. All right. So once again, extremely simple. Now we do need to make sure that in our cube that we are associating that physics material. If we don't and we watch the console, this is what is going to happen. Whenever we've got an empty slot, oh, okay, so it doesn't give us a null reference exception, but it has set the material back to none because it didn't find one. Okay, which is interesting. So I suppose if you want to replace the material and, and make sure it's none just leave that one empty i guess i was expecting a null reference exception but i didn't get one so i'll just put heavy in there and then put heavy in there 
will now watch this material slot. So at the moment it's still on bouncy, now it's on heavy. So we've simply replaced that. Now we can even change the box collider size, but this is something that is specific to a box collider. If I just go to component and take a look at the uh, physics, you can see that there are multiple colliders. There's box, sphere, capsule, mesh collider, wheel collider, terrain collider. At the moment we've just said um, collider. Okay, so my collider is just any type of collider. It could be any type of those. So what we need to do if we want to manipulate either the center or the size is be specific. We want to specifically access that box collider. So what I would need to do there is change my type specifically to a box collider. Okay, um, I don't think it will change anything. Yep, my collider, box collider, it hasn't got rid of the reference. That's good, so it's still there. That will now allow us to access the size for this collider. So now I can say my collider dot size is going to equal a new vector three. So I'm going to access this temporarily in the update instead of actually caching uh, a new vector three up here, which basically is going to stay in memory for the rest of the game. I only want it to temporarily be in the memory only while I'm actually resizing this collider, after which that bit of memory gets emptied and frees it up for something else. So if you don't need it to actually sit in memory all the time, you can temporarily create one here. So at the moment it's one by one by one. Let's make it three on the X, two on the Y and five on the Z, for example. And that will now resize the collider. So let's save that. And for this in the game, I'm going to switch on my gizmos so that I can see those. We can see this little green box here. So now when I press play and resize, there we go. Okay, we can see the collider and it will only show it for the object that you've currently got selected. So notice how we've resized that. That can be useful in certain games, for example, where you want a collider to become larger when it gets close to another object to detect if, for example, it's hitting another object, then maybe it gets smaller when it walks away from another object. Um, okay, so that's that's the box collider. We've also got our rigid body. We can change any of these elements, but let's just say something like is kinematic. Let's just switch that off. That will cause these objects to then fall down to the ground. So um, we called ours my RB for the rigid body. So let's say my RB dot is kinematic equals false. So that's simply how we switch it off. Um, generally, when you've got objects that have these check boxes, so just kinematic and use gravity, these are booleans, so they can either be true or false. Whereas you know if it's got these numbers in here, these are generally float values. Okay, and we'll take a look at these other drop down elements a little bit later. Okay, but for now, that should cause the cubes to actually drop down to the ground. And bear in mind, we made the um, collider boxes a bit bigger as well. There we go. So they're sat above the ground because we made those colliders a lot bigger. Um, if, for example, we choose to also switch off gravity, they will stay suspended in the air. So my RB dot is gravity, or should I put dot gravity? Ah, there we go. Use gravity equals false. Save. If we keep an eye on these two checkboxes, I press play. Whoa, check that out. Okay, that object is flying off into space, which is interesting. Uh, and it's because of the order. I made the is kinematic unchecked before the use gravity. So 
if in fact I reverse these, so control X, control V, let's see if that fixes that issue or if that stays the same. Oh, actually it stays the same, which is interesting. I wonder if I maybe, I suppose it's because of the um, orientation of this. It's, it's at a different orientation to this. So in other words, it's rotated around, it's closer to the ground. So if I were to pick this one up and maybe kind of just straighten it out just a little bit. Let's see what we get now. Yeah, it just, it just stays where it is basically. That's interesting. All right. So sometimes as you're working through things, you might spot these little um, these little items that go on that you were not expecting. So uh, it can be very unpredictable when you're working with scripts inside of a game engine. Um, but that's three very common um, types of components that you're going to get on game objects. In the next video, we'll take a look at other objects as well. Now let's imagine that from the cubes, whenever we left click, we also want this, the scripts that are on the cubes to actually change the material that's on the plane. And let's say we should already have the orange material. If not, just create one. It's really easy. And let's set the ground to be orange. Okay, so first of all, we need access to the plane object. So we need to get access to that. So public of type game object, and let's just call it my plane. Then we need access to that new material. So public of type material, let's call this orange mat. Oh, press wrong button. Okay, so when we press our left mouse button, what we simply want to do is say, my plane dot um, and this time I'm going to get the renderer directly from the plane because I'm not going to cache the renderer like we've done here. So to get that, we're going to say get component. I'm going to get the renderer. Now, whenever you get a component, you need to kind of open the component if you like. So does it return any values? By by putting in this open and close, it gives us access to that component. Then we can say dot material. And then we're going to make that equal, what did we call it? Orange mat. There we go. So notice the slight difference where we've got here my renderer dot material. We don't have to place these. We don't have to get the component. OK, but we can, if we want, get that component directly from any object, even during the update, even during runtime. So let's just save this and don't forget we need to update our missing slots. OK, so we've got my plane. Let's drag that in there. And then we've got our orange material into orange mat. Um, let's drag in plain and orange mat. So that now when we press play, there we go. All right, and the ground now becomes orange. All right, nice and easy. Now let's say, for example, in one of our cubes, we forgot to assign a material. So let's just click target and none to make it invisible. What I'm expecting is it's going to completely get rid of the material. If it does, it should turn a pink color. Let's just press play. Oh, uh, at least one of those did have a material. So let me set both of those to none. Turns this pink color. Uh, whenever you see this pink color, this is an indication, in fact, let me do it while it's running. This is an indication that there is no material. All right, it's the universal color to tell you something is missing. There's no renderer. 
there's no material. So if we say in mesh renderer element zero, non-material, there's no material showing up. That's why it's gone this pink color. So if you ever see that, that's effectively what's happening. All right, let's put the orange back into the orange mat. Now we also get other uh, type of components. For example, on directional light, we get a light component. And there's various things we can do. For example, we can change the overall color. We can change the intensity. We can even change the shadow types. Now these that have the drop downs, I don't want to get into those as of yet. We're going to take a look at those later. But we do have slider values that are that should be float values between zero and ninety. But notice that you get decimal points. Okay, we get uh, real time shadows, strength, etc., so that we can reduce the strength of those shadows on the light. Could even use a cookie, etc. Um, so let's do something with the light. Let's change the color of it and the intensity. Okay, so first of all we need access to the light itself. Now we could either do that as a game object and then get the component, or we can cache the component itself. I'll cache the component itself. So public of type light, and I'll call it, um, well, keep the same naming convention, I'll call it my light. And we also want to change its color as well. So let's create a public of type color and let's call it my color. You will notice that as I was doing that, I'll just, just for testing purposes, uh, color, we get a color and a color 32. So the difference between these color 32 is going to have 32 bits. This regular color just is your standard color that's made up of red, green, blue, and alpha. So your color 32 is going to have high dynamic range. So it's going to allow um, really intense values of whites, reds, greens. So it's going to have a lot more data in it. But for now, we only really want to stick with color. But just save this and go to my script. So we're going to notice we've got my light. So let's drag directional light into here. And same again. And we've also got a little color picker. So we can click on this and we can now set a different color. Let's in fact set it to bright red. So all the way up to the top. If you want an exact copy um, between both of them, let's say you've chosen a, a, a specific color and you don't know how to get the same one on both, you can actually just copy your hexadecimal value and then paste it into the other one. But I'm just going to do an intense kind of red. Notice I could just paste that value in there. Okay, um, alpha is not really going to do much on the light, so I don't need to change that. So let's now say um, my light dot color equals my color. All right, nice and easy. My light dot intensity equals, and it's at the moment it's at one. Let's set it to 2.5. Okay, so we'll increase its intensity. So now when I save that, let's press play. Now that seems to have gone like a really kind of dark orange. That's because my light is now um, changing the color of everything. So if you click on directional light, we can see that that's gone to red. The intensity is at 2.5. So let's take this green color, for example, and let's just change its smoothness a little bit. So it actually has a bit of reflectivity. Let's make it a little bit metallic as well. And now if we press play, uh, not necessarily that much. I was hoping that we might see a bit of the red kind of bouncing off that, but no, not really. Okay. Um, yep, so that, that's the directional light. We also have our main camera as well. So we've got a camera. It's also got an audio listener so that it can hear any sounds that are going on in the game. Let's say uh, for this that we want to change, let's say something like the field of view, which is currently set at 60. 
If I change the field of view, I can either zoom out or zoom in. All right, so 60 is the default kind of value. So let's change that. So once again, cache the actual object. So public of type camera, I'll call my camera. And then here I can say my camera dot field of view equals, let's say, 25.5. So that should zoom the camera in. And because I've got, obviously, two scripts, I've got to attach the camera on both. If not, I'm going to get a null reference exception. There we go. So let's try it again now. Whoa, seriously zoomed in to the point where I can't even see the cubes anymore. So if I check my main camera, now you can see the field of view is set to exactly 25.5. Okay, so now I've got a little bit of a challenge for you. I want you to have a go experiment with a couple of these things. Let's say, um, for example, that you might want to change the field of view to something else. You might want to have a go with some clipping planes or view rectangles, see what they do. In your directional light, you might want to change uh, your intensity and your color further. Don't get into these drop downs at the moment. You might want to change your real time shadow strength. Have a go at changing some of these values. Okay. Um, you could also, for example, play around with the this one's a mesh collider that has a convex. If you wanted to do that, you would have to create a new collider type, but it would have to be specifically mesh collider because only the mesh collider has the convex option. Uh, you could have a go at changing your rigid body's mass, drag, angular drag, etc., and just experiment with these values before the next video. Now you will notice that on these objects uh, in our script, we've got a lot of elements in our inspector. That means that if we've got, let's say, 100 cubes, we're going to have to drag all of these items in manually. That's going to take a long time. Now, because these are all inherited from the original object that the script is attached to, we actually don't need to make them public in the inspector. We can just get the components directly from the object. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So in the start, we know that the my renderer, my collider, my rigid body are all inherited from this specific object. So we can simply say my renderer, make sure I spell it correctly, uh, equals get component of type renderer. And that will get it from whatever it is attached to. Okay, so it will get it from this specific object. Once again, my collider equals get component of type collider. And this is in fact box collider. Okay, and then RB, so my RB equals get component. And this is going to be of type rigid body. And once again, that's going to, um, oh, uh, I've put a capital B, should be in lowercase b. And that will obviously get all of those elements. So let's see that in action. So what I'm going to do with my cube is I'm going to set these to none. Okay, just click on here, none, none, and none. Okay, so we're going to watch this now, so those will get populated. So once we press play, there we go, they automatically got added because it got it from the object itself. Now something where you're pulling the object in from the project uh, you probably it probably is easier just to drag that in there okay um, heavy P mat as well but what about something like plane light and my camera 
Okay, well, these actually exist in the hierarchy. And generally, we can just tell the object to find these items. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of ways to do that. So first of all, by its name itself. So if we just copy the name, Control and C, we can say um, my plane equals game object because that's what it is dot find and then allow us to find it by name but it needs to be inside quotation marks okay and then that will then go off and find that specific object in the hierarchy by its name uh, we can do the same thing with directional light so control and C so it's called uh, my light equals game object dot find directional light and it has to be spelled exactly the same which is the reason why I copy uh, that now oh actually yeah I'm, I'm finding the directional light as a game object but it's expecting it as an actual light so in that case I want to find it then I want to do dot get component off the light and I want it to be the actual light component open and close brackets and semicolon on the end I've got to convert it into the correct type of object okay uh, and then finally we also have camera as well so simply called main camera control and C so my camera equals game object dot find and because it's the camera component dot get component of type camera open and close brackets to let it know that it should assign that okay there we go so those items are now set up in the start you would generally only want to do this one time right at the beginning of your game when the script gets switched on so that they automatically get assigned as opposed to doing it multiple frames in the update so once again let's go to cube and let's get rid of plane so let's just click none let's get rid of directional light let's click none let's get rid of my camera let's click none okay so once again when i press play they all get uh, they all get added all right which makes it so much easier if you've got like as I say 100 items you don't want to be manually adding those by hand uh, something like my color we can actually set this as well uh, what we know what we're noticing here is that all of our color values are red green blue and alpha they all have at least three numbers two five five zero 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 okay so I can actually replicate that in code I can set it up in fact uh, here which is my color I could say equals new color and then it was 255 zero, zero, zero. so that's 255 in the red zero in the green zero in the blue zero in the alpha and now where I'm saying uh, my light dot color equals my color, I'm setting that up. So in fact, I can set this color, um, let's say to private. So it doesn't even show up in the inspector. So that will then disappear. So if I were to now um, click this and then left click and the light should have turned into red all right so I've set that specifically inside of the script so something like my camera I can now turn that to private because it really doesn't matter I'm, I'm initializing that in the start something like my light I can also set that to private something like my plane private um, the rigid body private box collider private and renderer private and just to make everything a little 
bit more organized take anything that's public control and X and just put it a little further down here to keep all of the public elements together control and X control and V and then I can get rid of these spaces and then I could potentially just leave myself a comment so private variables and then here I can have a comment public variables which cleans it up nicely so now if I save and check my cube now all I have now are just three elements that are all coming from the project that I would need to initialize there and it basically cleans it up keeps it nice and organized even though we've got quite a lot going on there all of it is being initialized in the script so once you've effectively done that the first time you can then basically just forget about that it doesn't matter what you attach the script to it's automatically going to set itself up now we can also get components off a child object or a parent object so let's take a look at the child object so while I've got cube selected, if I right click and let's say create uh, a sphere, the sphere is right there. Okay, so I'll just go into scene view and let's say I'll move that down. Okay, that sphere is a child of the cube because it belongs to it. We can see that in the hierarchy. If I can close it down and it disappears, that means it's the child of the cube. The sphere itself has a sphere collider. So let's try and get that. So what we say here is um, let's add a private of type. In fact, no, actually, I'll add it as a public so that we can see it appear uh, of sphere collider. Let's call it S collider. OK, in the start, we do something very similar to what we did here but this time we're going to say s collider equals get component as we can see here we've got a whole range of get components the one that we want is get component in children and the component we want is the sphere collider okay um so that will then go off and get a sphere collider. Let's just check that. Now, uh, I may very well get an error pop up because only one of the objects has a sphere collider. So let's just test this. So there's a sphere collider. Oh, I didn't get an error. That's interesting. Uh, and it's automatically found it from the object. Now let's say, for example, that they have multiple spheres. Let's do control and D, control and D. So now I've got multiple spheres that are all children, child objects. Let's press play again. Automatically found it. But which one did it choose? Let's click on it chose the first one so it will basically go through the child objects and it will find the first one that it um, hits now if we want to get all of the uh, sphere colliders then we're going to need an array okay so that we can store more than one uh, component of the same type so back in our script we simply take our sphere collider and we turn it into an array okay now uh, once I've turned it into an array, I'm going to get this. Can I implicitly convert type Unity Engine Sphere Collider to Unity Engine Sphere Collider Array? So what we do is we simply just add an S. Get components in children, and that will then return all of the items in an array. Let's do save. Wait for this to update. Now we're going to get an array, S Collider. So when we now press play, Okay, it's found three sphere colliders and it's returned all of them. All of the items from the children. Now let's imagine, for example, just element one, we actually wanted to switch this specific sphere collider off. Okay, 
Um, or let's say we only wanted to set that one to be uh, a trigger. Well, easy enough. So in our input, let's say S collider, and we're going to tell it which one to use. So we've got zero, one, and two. So we want number one dot is trigger equals true. And that's how we can manipulate the arrays in a basic fashion. So if I save that now, press play, if I left click, and now we can see the red light coming across that uh, item in our sphere one. Got an index out of range. Let me check this. Oh, that could very well be on the second one. Uh, that's where my red error comes from. It's coming from this cube. It's looking for an array of spheres, but it can't find any. So don't worry about that. But now we can see in our sphere one, the is trigger is checked. On the other ones, it's unchecked. So it's definitely worked. Uh, index out of range exception. So what does this mean? This means it's looking for, we've told it effectively to look for an index of one. But when it checks it on this object, it finds it has no items. It's got an index of zero. So we're trying to find something greater than the index that exists. That gives you an index out of range exception. Um, yeah, so easily enough, we could just, for example, just add some spheres. Okay, so one, two, three. So it's got the same amount if I play now. no errors okay because now it's fixed and sphere one is checked sphere one is checked on here as well all right nice and easy uh, now as well as get component in children we could also have a script attached let's say uh, let's say to one of these and we could get component in parent so we can go up as well to detect anything that exists on the parent object. Now, because the script is attached to objects that don't have parents, um, we wouldn't use that right now, but it's simply just a case of changing children to parent. And it will go up the stack instead of going down the stack. All right, nice and easy. I'll just put that back to the way it was. Now you will notice that some of these items have this little check mark here. This is effectively to switch the item on or off. Okay, we've got one for the entire object itself. We can switch the entire object off as well as the various components with the exception of the rigid body. If you want to switch the rigid body off, you will simply make it kinematic. If you want it on, you'll uncheck the kinematics. It starts using gravity. All right, but typically once you've added the rigid body, it's always left switched on. As part of the sphere, we also have the same thing. Notice these check marks. You wouldn't normally switch off the mesh filter because that's what defines its physical mesh. Um, same on the plane, on the directional light, you can even switch the light off itself just by doing that. On the main camera, you can actually switch the camera component off. So it says no cameras rendering. Or you can even switch off the audio listener for it to stop picking up audio. Okay, so let's take a look at how we could actually switch some of these items off. Well, we've just been working with sphere colliders. So what we could say here uh, is to switch them all off. So let's start with zero. Sphere collider dot zero dot is, uh, sorry, dot enabled equals false. That simply switches it off. Okay, so let's just copy that, paste, paste, one, two. All right, so that should effectively switch all of our colliders off. Let's test this. So just click on sphere one. We can see the collider there as soon as I click. Well, it's sphere collider is switched off, but it's still kind of showing that. It 
showing it still being there but we can see over here that it's definitely switched these items off all right excellent we can even switch the entire game object off so let's take a look at how we can do that so the game object itself is just itself okay so we could say this dot set active oh, we've got to get the transform dot game object dot set active to false all right so this is from the game object section itself set active is that little checkbox there okay that's what it's called so as soon as we set it to false that will then switch the items off so if we save this now and test it again there we go both items are now switched off and you'll see they're grayed out in the hierarchy now let's see what happens if we change the order so if I take this control and X and put it first in the list Control and V. Save this. Press play. Oh, it did actually perform all of the actions, which was interesting. Okay, so it did go through everything and it has performed all of the actions. Wasn't entirely sure whether it would because obviously we're switching the item off immediately. I wondered if it wouldn't go through all of this, but in fact, it actually did. Okay, uh, so now I've got a bit of a challenge for you. I want you to go through some of these, such as switch a box collider off, switch a mesh renderer off, switch a light off uh, in the script, and then test it out and see if that's the case. Okay, so I'm just going to take this game object set active false so that it doesn't interfere with anything. You have a go at doing that before the next video. So now we want to take a look at how can we get um, the components from the other object, not by caching them, but when one object collides into another object. So imagine if, for example, you had 100 cubes in your game, you wouldn't necessarily want to cache every component on all 100 items. Instead, you only want to get access to the components at the point where it's relevant, at the point where a collision has taken place. So for this, I'm just going to write a new script. So I'm just going to remove the component test script of both cubes. Uh, and I'm also going to remove these spheres as well. So let's just delete those. Okay, so um, both cubes have box colliders, rigid bodies, mesh renderers. And I think I'll reset everything back to where it currently was so i'll set it back to its original values rotation of zero 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 yeah and what i want to make sure is that both cubes can effectively move into each other now if you notice there this one's way up above that cube so just make sure the two of those can effectively collide. So I'm just going to move this one back so that we can see this. Great. Okay, so cube one is this one over on the left. So in the script folder, I'm going to right click, choose create C sharp script, and I'll call it um, collider components. Okay, so for this one, start and update, we're not necessarily that interested in update. I'm going to leave start on there. Okay, and we actually don't need to cache anything at the moment. Uh, what we're really interested in is a collision, or in this in this case, a trigger collider. So we want to say on trigger enter. And as you can see, there's on trigger enter for 3D and on trigger enter for 2D. So we want to use the 3D one. Uh, enter or return to autocomplete. It's going to recognize, uh, based on a collider, when it when something with a trigger 
hit something else as a collider. It's going to register what it got hit in this variable of other. Okay, so first of all, let's just return what is other. So debug.log other. Simply going to return that so that we can see exactly what that is registering. So I'm just going to save that. And I'm only going to attach this script onto cube one. Okay, so for this, I actually want to separate out the game and the scene so that I can control this in the scene view. I'm just going to watch the console. Now I've got a couple of warnings. Don't need to worry about those. Really interested in the comments. Okay. So if I now press play, nothing happens until this object, it's the other object, and then we can see what got returned. So other is cube and it's a box collider. So it's effectively returned this return this cube and it's returned this box collider. That's what it recognized. Okay, great. So now we know what it's returning. We can actually get something from that collider. So we can say uh, other dot um, transform dot game object dot get component and let's get its renderer. Okay, at the moment we can do that, but I'm also gonna cache a material. So let's say public of type material, let's call it green mat. Back down here, I'm gonna say dot material equals green mat. So I'm effectively going to change its material on when an on trigger enter takes place. So let's save that. Let's go to our um, cube one and we can see that we need a green mat. If I click on this, I've got all my materials. I just want to choose the green. Okay, let's test this again and we're watching this cube. There we go, as soon as I hit it, it turns green. All right, so I know it spoke uh, to that component. As I say, if you have 100 cubes, you don't need to uh, register every one of them, only at the point at which you hit the object. And because I'm getting the component inside the on trigger enter, once I leave this curly bracket, and let's say go down here and there's something else, that get component is completely flushed out of memory. Okay, it doesn't remember it anymore. So if I try to access this other outside, let's say in start or something else, other is presumably gonna go red. All right, because it doesn't know what it is. The name other does not exist. I could, for example, type void update. Okay, if I try and access other from here, it won't allow me because now it doesn't recognize it because it's left those curly brackets. It's only relevant as long as it's a return value of this um, particular function. Okay, so um, now that we've done that, we could potentially destroy the other object. We could say other, uh, or rather destroy and then destroy requires some kind of an object to destroy so let's say other dot game object I need to tell it what it is because other on its own is just a collider okay I need to access its game object if I leave it at that it will destroy it immediately or I could put a comma and then it's giving me the option of adding a float for time Okay, so let's say we destroy it after one second. Let's try it again now. Let's do save. There we go, and it gets destroyed after exactly one second. Notice that cube is no longer in the hierarchy. It's completely been destroyed out of the game. 
the only thing that's left is cube one. So there's a big difference between switching off an object, it's still in the hierarchy and it's gone gray, and actually destroying an object that completely disappears from the hierarchy. Okay, now let's say, for example, that I did cache it originally. So if I said um, private um, of type game object, and I call it cube obj this time. And in the start, I do cube obj uh, dot game object dot find whoops wrong way around I need to do an equals game object dot find and I believe it was just called cube let me double check that make sure that that is the case yep it's just called cube okay so I'm going to register that there and then it's going to get destroyed so now imagine in a void update that I want to access the cube obj transform dot translate and let's say I want to move it on its x-axis slightly okay so by 0 0.1 f in fact maybe just a little more than that 0 0.8 f multiplied by time dot delta time 0 0 okay that is reliant on the object actually still being part of the game. Now let me just make this destroy time a little bit quicker so that it gets destroyed almost instantly. We should now see some kind of a red error appear. Okay, notice the object is now moving. As soon as I hit it, there we go, I've got my red error, missing reference exception. Because the object has been destroyed out of the hierarchy, it's trying to access it to move it, but it can't find it. All right, so that's one of the limitations of um, doing things like that. Um, when, when a collision happens against another object, you do something like destroy it. There may be some kind of a dependency on another script. Another script might be accessing that object to do something. And as soon as you destroy the object, you're going to start getting these little red errors popping up. There is a way to check if the object is still alive. So we can say if, and it's called cube obj. So we can say if cube obj, and we want to check if it's not equal to null. In other words, it's not empty. So not uh, a not is an exclamation mark equal to null. So in other words, as long as it's not empty, do this. If it is empty, ignore this command altogether. And that will stop any of those red errors from appearing. So remember, two equals will be if that is equal to null, but with an exclamation mark before it, that means it's not equal to null. So in other words, it means it's full with something. Let's try it again. So the object is moving, I hit it, it gets destroyed, no red error. Okay, so that's a way to actually fix that item. Uh, and doing these various little checks like this in a lot of scripts is generally good practice and it's just to avoid any kind of errors from appearing. Now at the moment, um, our cube object is going to turn any object hits that has a collider green and then it will effectively destroy it also includes the ground so if I play move down you notice that goes green and gets destroyed okay so if we've got a lot of objects in our scene we probably don't want our characters or objects actually moving into each other and just destroying absolutely everything imagine if for example your character was walking around touches the terrain the terrain disappears touches some props they disappear you only want it to affect certain things. So the way that we achieve this is by using the tag system. So we've got a tag up here. So if I click on cube, 
let's check. These are the internal tags that already exist, respawn, finish, etc. We can also add our own tags. So just click plus, uh, I'll call it cube. You can call them anything you like, it really doesn't matter. But however you name this, that has to be the same in script. And if I now duplicate, let's say this cube, so control and D, or you can go to edit and duplicate. Uh, and let's just move this one this way. Uh, and then let's do another duplicate and move this one just over here. In fact, I'll move it even closer so that we can see this working. Uh, so for this first cube that we've, uh, the one that's a bit closer, we can give this one a tag of cube. Uh, the second one that we duplicated, we'll leave that one untagged. And the third one, which is this one, the one that's furthest away, uh, we'll also tag that one as cube as well. So if we now press play, as I move through them, we can see that it is affecting all three at the moment, but obviously we need to change our script. So as soon as we tell it only to affect things that actually have um, a tag of cube, then it will be very different and it will be very specific on what it's actually affecting. Okay, just wait for this to update. So at the moment it's, um, Anything that is on trigger enter, it is effectively doing this. Okay, so um, what we need to say is if the other object, whatever it's just collided against, dot compare tag, and we need to give it the tag. Now it needs to be spelled exactly the same as the actual tag itself. So it needs to be spelled exactly the same as whatever you've got there. If you've put a capital C, it needs to be capitalized. If um, it's different in any way, it needs to be exactly the same there because the string references need to be absolutely accurate, including any capitalization. Okay, and then we're just gonna contain all of this inside of those curly brackets. Let's just save that. So now it will only apply if we get an object that's been tagged as cube. So let's try again. Okay, it, it's that one, has no effect whatsoever, it's that one. So that one, because it's not tagged as cube, there's no change whatsoever. It also doesn't affect the ground in any way. All right, so it can be very specific on what objects it's actually uh, affecting. Now in this video, we want to take a look at how we could actually add a component, but through the script itself. Uh, so on our cube, uh, I've just closed these down a little bit so that I've got more space. Uh, what I want to do is effectively add a sound file to this. So I could go to add component, type in audio source, and just add an audio source in that way. Okay. Um, and then assign an audio clip to the audio clip and get it to play. All right. But I want to do that using script itself. Uh, so if I right click and remove that, uh, we're actually going to do that. But first of all, you will find in the resources that you've got a sound file called ding. Okay, it's just a, a little bell sound that we're going to have play when uh, the cube actually hits another object. So let's right click in project, create a new folder, and I'll call this sounds. So we can keep everything nice and organized. Let's drag this in. Uh, this is a wave file. So um, it's uncompressed audio as opposed to MP3. Generally, when you're bringing in small sound files, you want them generally uncompressed. If you bring in an MP3 file, which is a compressed sound, technically what the computer has to do is uncompress it in order to play it and then recompress it again, which takes time. If it's uncompressed, it doesn't have to do anything. All it has to do is compress it down for use within the game, okay, which is effectively what it's saying here, decompress on load if it's already compressed audio, which it isn't at the moment. Uh, and then it'll use the compression format of Vorbis to recompress the sound ready for playback in the game.
Okay, uh, so what we're going to do, we're, we're going to effectively play this sound whenever our cube hits an object that's tagged as cube. Okay, so um, we're going to do that on, uh, I think this is the wrong cube actually, so I think it's going to be cube one. We're going to do this on here and we're going to do it as part of our script. So let's double click. Um, so first of all, um, we could just simply do something like this. We just simply need to tell it to add a component. Okay, so we'll say add it to this dot game object, and it always needs to be added to a game object dot add component. Okay, and it simply adds a component class of type, so it needs to know what type of component uh, to the game object. Okay, so let's use that one, add component. You always add it inside of these angular brackets. Okay, less than, more than. And it simply needs to know the type. Okay, so we want to add an audio source. There we go. And then we open and close brackets to tell it that um, it's a component. Okay. Uh, so if we save that, um, one of the issues that we're going to find is that each time it it's something of type cube, it's going to add a new audio source. Uh, so for example, if I take all of my objects and make sure that they all are all tagged as cube. Okay, so we've got a few of them. Um, if we now watch our inspector, just close everything down so that we've got more space. Press play. Okay, I get one, I get two, and then I get three. Okay, so now I've got three audio sources on the same uh, objects, which obviously we don't want that to happen. You'll also notice that doing it this way uh, it will add a very slight delay to the game. So generally it's better if you add the component outside of script, but if, if you need to get around that, if you definitely need to add a component in script, this is the way in which you would do it. Now we also need to add a clip to this as well. So what we're going to do is effectively add this audio source into a variable so that we can see that it's actually getting added. I'm going to make this public of type audio source. Simply call this my player. Also want access to that sound clip as well. So public of type uh, audio clip. Now call it, uh, I think it was called ding, as in like a bell ding. Um, so I'll call it that. Now what we effectively want to do here is check if an audio source has already been added to this variable. If it has, don't add any more audio sources. So we can say if my player is equal to null, so in other words it's already empty, then go ahead and add a component. Okay, so let's save that now. So we'll try it. So we should only get one audio source now. I'll just wait for this to update. So now we can see that we've got my player. We've also got this audio clip as well. So if I click on here, we can instantly see that it's found a sound file. Okay, so let's press play now very first one, it adds an audio source, but we should notice that it... Ah, I know why. I have not assigned it to my variable. That's why it didn't work. So here we need to say my player equals this dot game object okay so in other words when it creates this component it's also going to associate it with this slot let's try that again so i'm going to keep an eye on this slot to make sure that the audio source gets added there we go got added so now the next time it doesn't have any effect and we only have one audio source. Now we can see that instantly it says play on the wake. We don't want that. Okay, so we want to uncheck the play on the wake, which we can instantly do right here. 
So we can say my player dot play on the wake equals false. So we'll instantly switch that off. We also want to pass our sound file, our clip, into the player. So we can say my player dot clip equals, and we called it ding. And then we want it to play. So we'll say my player. Now we also need this to do that every time that it hits this cube. Okay. So um, instead of putting it here, what I'm going to say is else. In other words, my player is not equal to null. Then I'm going to say my player dot play. And that will instantly start to play as long as my player is not equal to null. So in other words, it already has a my player in there. Uh, so for this, I want to make sure that I have the mute audio unchecked so that we can actually hear the audio. And let's try it. Okay, so it happened, but on the first time that it did it, it didn't work. Okay, uh, that's because as it was running through it, it found that my player is equal to null. So what I'll do, I'll duplicate this, control and C. Uh, since this statement will only be true on the first time, all the other times it will be else. So now it should play during that first collision as well. Okay, awesome. Uh, so it actually um, got added dynamically and it played. But as I say, there is a very slight delay when you actually add components in this way. Uh, but it is possible, okay? Um, so you can add any component you like whenever you like. Now in the last video, we took a look at uh, actually adding a component in the script itself. Uh, there are obviously multiple ways to do this, like anything else, uh, and we can actually have something called dependencies. This is where a script recognizes that it needs a certain component and it will automatically add it for you. Uh, so let's actually add an audio source by using dependencies. So for this one, we actually start writing it outside of the class itself, just below the using. Okay, so if we come down here, we open it with square brackets and then we say require component. Okay, and then it's going to want to know what type of component. Okay, so it gives you some kind of a, uh, an organizational layout. Okay, so system type required component and then you've got a bunch of overloads if you want any of those. Okay, so I'm simply going to say type of audio source. Okay, and that will then automatically recognize that I need the audio source and it will actually add it for me without me having to do anything. And it will do that in the editor. You don't even have to press play for it to recognize that. This is usually used in order to save any kind of errors or issues that happen. So if you've got a script that's entirely dependent on a certain component being on the game object, by writing it up here, it's going to make sure you're not going to get any errors definitely has that component, it will definitely work. Okay, now I can simply take uh, these two statements, control and C, and actually put them in the start. Okay, but I also need to set my, my player um, so that it gets the audio source. So I'll simply say my player equals get component audio source. And because I know it's definitely going to have an audio source, it's not going to return any kind of an error. Okay, so if I now press save and I check the cube, um, 
Now I'm going to right click and remove this script. Okay, notice there's no audio source. So right click and remove, and then as soon as I come over to my Collider component script, add it, I've now got my audio source. It will automatically add that for me because of that particular line. All right, it's pretty useful. Could also, for example, if I just copy this, and let's paste it a couple of times, and I say I also need a rigid body. type of rigid body make sure it does turn green otherwise it's not a type and it's been spelled incorrectly uh, and maybe also a box collider let's say I need all those three things for my script to work okay so if I save that and let's just say and bear in mind uh, it only adds those once you drag the script on there so if I've made any changes to the script if any of those items were not on my object it wouldn't actually get added. Okay, so you have to drag the script in for it to recognize that. Uh, so let's just say that I create um, even an empty, an empty object that's got literally nothing in it. And then as soon as I drag that script on it, I'm gonna get all those items. All right, so I get an audio source, a rigid body, and a box collider. So that was the order in which I laid them out. Okay, uh, so that is extremely useful. Um, I would definitely recommend using that and if you check out any kind of more professional scripts you will usually find that they have written required components at the top of their scripts. It can save lots of time and also lots of errors or issues later on. We also have the option of actually spawning items into the world during runtime. So they don't exist in the editor to begin with, but you can actually spawn them while you're actually playing the game. Uh, so for this, you would need some kind of a preset, uh, a prefab, basically an object that's been pre-created that you just basically wanting to bring into the world. So in the assets folder, I'm just gonna right click, create a new folder, and then we'll call this prefabs. Uh, generally, I like to keep everything nicely named so I know exactly where to find everything. So let's say, for example, uh, just a regular cube like this. It's tagged as cube. It has a box collider and it's got a rigid body, but no script. Okay, I want that to come in exactly the same way. I want it to have that tag. I want it to have those components. So what I can do, I can actually take that cube, just drag it down into the prefabs folder and that will actually prefab it it's like one that i made earlier and then at any point i can then just drag a new one into the world and it's set up in the exact same way with the same tag it's got all the same colliders etc as opposed to creating a fresh cube and having to add those manually you'll also notice that when you've got a prefab it turns blue and you've got a little arrow so if you click on the arrow it will actually take you into prefab editing mode. The background kind of grays out and you're just working on that object entirely. Anything you make a change to here will get applied to the prefab. So, uh, for example, if I have this cube and drag another one and another one, so I've got a few of them, and I make a change to one of them. Let's say I had a component of audio source and I come back out we're now going to see that all of our prefabs have all got audio sources. Okay, because you make a change to one, it applies it to all the other of the same prefab type. Notice though, it hasn't made the change to, let's say, cube two, because that's not a prefab. It only exists in the actual scene view, not in the project window. Okay, so um, what I want to do is effectively take out cube two, cube three. I just want to leave cube one, uh, or rather the original prefab of the cube. Uh, now I actually want to break the prefab. So I know I've already got a prefab, so I know I've definitely saved that, so I'm fine. So now I can right click on this, I can choose prefab, and you'll only see that if it is an actual prefab. If it's not, that, that will not be there. And I can do a whole bunch of stuff with it, including unpack completely. Now it's gone back to like just a gray object that only exists in this scene. 
it's completely unrelated to this prefab now. So let's say I start removing stuff. So I'm going to right click and remove the audio source, right click and remove the rigid body, right click, remove the box collider, even want to remove the mesh renderer, even want to remove the cube mesh filter. So all I'm left with is a transform. That's basically the point at which this prefab is going to spawn into the world. I'm even going to change the name of this to uh, something like spawn point. Doesn't even need a tag. I can untag that. Okay. So to actually spawn an object in, all you really need is a point in the world, a spawn point and a prefab. Okay. So um, let's go back to cube one. I've even got this game object in there that I no longer need. So I'll delete that. Uh, let's find our script, our collider script. Um, just set this up actually green uh, my player and ding okay uh, gonna go back into the script and we need to set up a couple of variables first public it's of transform so it's position in space and I'll call this spawn point and then I need the prefab itself so that will actually be a game object and I will call it something like my prefab you only need those two variables in order to spawn in an item. And let's do it in the update. So if I press something. So I'm going to say if input dot get mouse button down. Let's say it's the left mouse button. Uh, yeah, left mouse button. So the keyword for spawning is instantiate. It's going to tell you what it requires. Okay. Uh, and by the way, whenever you see this one of 10, it's telling you that there are 10 options that you can use for instantiate and you can actually move through them. So two, three, four, notice that they keep getting added to this. Uh, some of them might change slightly. Okay. So you've got a whole bunch of options that you can use for this. Uh, now I'm just going to, uh, work through it step by step. So first I want to instantiate. What do I want to instantiate? Well, that is going to be my prefab. That's what I want to bring into the world. So I'm going to say my prefab. Then it's going to know, want to know where should it be applied? So what should be its transform parent? So it's going to take on the same position as the parent. So think of this just as the position. So that's going to be spawn point dot position then it's going to need to know um, well it says ball instantiate in world space but in fact you could either do that true or false and it could either be world space or local space okay but in fact what I want is rotation so in fact, if I come down here this is the one that I want to do rotation so I'm going to say spawn point dot rotation so it's going to take on the rotation that spawn point cube and that's it. That's all I need in order to instantiate. So it's going to take this object and it's going to bring it in at the spawn points position and spawn points rotation. So it's going to be facing the same direction as that object. So if I now save this and wait for that to update. Okay, I've now got a couple of empty slots. So first of all, our spawn point needs dragging in there. And then the my prefab is going to be, what did I call it? Prefabs, it was just called cube. Okay, so let's drag this one into here. All right, so that is basically getting spawned in out of the project window, not from the hierarchy. So it's bringing it in to the world from outside. Uh, I'll just make this bigger so that we can definitely see this. Switch off the gizmos. Okay, so now if I left click, there we go. I've spawned in a cube and you can see there it says cube clone. If I press again, I'm going to get more and more clones. Okay, I've got a whole bunch of them now showing up. So every time I click, I'm going to get those and it's effectively going to copy whatever was in the original prefab. So it's got box collider, rigid body, audio source, and it is tagged as cube, which also means that if 
uh, I move my cube one I've not set it up with any move things if I move forward there we go it's going to affect all of those and in fact it wiped them all out in one go but I can always add more okay so that's how you actually spawn objects into the world now we want to take a look at using scripts as uh, components all right so for example on this uh, cube we've got a number of components but the script itself is also a component and can be treated as a component by other scripts so we're going to take a look at the different ways in which we can have one script communicate with another script um, but i want to do this as a separate item. So I'm going to right click and remove the script that we currently already have. I'm going to remove the audio source, remove the rigid body, remove the box collider. All right. So all we're left with really is just a cube. Let's call it cube original. I'm also done with the spawn point. So I don't need to spawn anything else in. I'm just going to keep the plane and the cube original. Okay. So for this in the script, going to right click create a new C sharp script and I'll call this uh, call this script um, one okay wait for that to update uh, and then we're eventually going to create script two um, so I could actually just duplicate this one I mean, obviously I can create a new script as well, but if I do a com control and D to duplicate, so now I've got script two, I'm going to get a red error. All right. So in the console, it's going to tell me that the name glo global uh, namespace, global namespace already contains a definition for script one. I'm going to get a few errors. What this effectively means is that I've got two scripts with different names, but they're both using the same class name. So if I double click on this, it's still called script one, even though the script is actually script two. So what you have to do in that case is make sure that the class name matches the script name. Um, sometimes it's necessary to duplicate a script in this way. All you have to do in order to make that work is just change the name of the class. Okay, that will get rid of any red errors. You might want to duplicate a script if it's got a whole bunch of code in it that you want to use um, for something else. You want to modify it slightly. But you don't want to have to retype everything. You could just do it that way. Okay, so let's go back to script one. Um, let's not have any variables whatsoever in the script and we don't even need a start. I want something to happen on the update. So let's say if input dot get mouse button down and I want it to be something like uh, zero. What they effectively want it to do is to broadcast a message to the other script. Okay. Um, so that's just a case of typing broadcast message and then a particular function or method name. Remember when I said uh, methods and functions, some people use one or the other, they're pretty much the same thing. Okay. Um, so let's call this maybe something you can type absolutely anything in there really doesn't matter okay um as long as the function that you're writing has the exact same name all right if i wanted to call that gibberish or something that doesn't make any sense doesn't really matter as long as um the other script has something that corresponds to it okay but i would not recommend right giving your function names just random nonsensical kind of names it's always better to have it mean something so that it makes sense so um generally when you broadcast message it will tell us it will call the method name on every mono behavior in this game so in other words in in this game object sorry um so that means every script that has one of these functions will be called as long as it actually belongs to cube original so if if the cube original had any kind of child objects and they had scripts um, that had those functions technically it should be calling those okay but this object is separate 
this object has no relation whatsoever to cube so we actually have to find the game object and I'm going to find it by its name plane okay remember I have to spell that exact so I'm going to say game object dot find and it's called plane and then I do a dot okay so that basically means find the plane and then any scripts on there broadcast a message called something so over into script 2 all I now need to do is create that function but I need to make it public so that it can be called by other scripts uh, void something and then in there I can do something okay um, so as a little bit of a challenge for you I want you to try and get um, script 1 which is on the cube whenever you left click I want it to change the material on the ground so that it becomes green now I've done this before if you remember so on script 2 you just need to set it up so that when this function runs uh, the material on the ground changes to green okay if you're not entirely sure how to do that uh, I'll show you in the solution to the next video How did you get on with that task? So hopefully you've got something like this uh, in your script too. We just declared a new renderer, my renderer, public material, green mat, then in something, my renderer.material equals green mat. So that will basically just change that material. Just make sure on your cube original, you've got your script one, on your plane, you've got your script two, and you've dragged in the mesh renderer into there and the green material into that slot so that now when I press play there we go okay so one script is talking to another script now obviously much like any other um, thing that you can do in script there are multiple ways that you can achieve the same thing um, so let's say for example in this script I want to add let's say a boolean so I'll have this as private. In fact, no, actually, I'm going to make this public so that I can speak to it from the other script. If I make it private, I won't have access to it. So by making this public, I'm going to give it a type of ball and I'm going to say can destroy. I'm going to initialize that as false. Then in the update, I'm going to say if can destroy is equal to true simply destroy this object which is game object after let's say two seconds and then we want to access that ball from our script one and get it to destroy itself so back to script one I'm going to say if input dot get mouse button down this time I'll use the right mouse button well, very similar to what we've done here. I want to do game object dot find. And I want to find the plane object. Now this time I want to get the component. And the component I want is actually the script itself. So I use its name. Okay, so script two. Notice it goes green. And then when I open and close brackets, I've got access to that script. So now when I press dot, Going to have access to all variables including can destroy and I can set that equal to true so from this script I can access the other script and change its boolean all right which is really really useful let's uh, save this and let's try it so if I now press play so if I left click it goes green if I right click it gets destroyed after two seconds okay so the functionality for that was in script one but it was accessing and talking to script two so that's how you use a script as a component we could also uh, do something like actually enable or disable the actual script itself so instead of can destroy we can see it simply say dot enabled 
equals false. That will simply switch that script off. So we've got something running on that script and we want that script to completely switch off, not be running anymore. We can access it from a different script and do that. So if we take a look at plane, we'll keep an eye on this checkbox right here. So if I right click, there we go, it's gone off. So now if I left click, ooh, it still turns green. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. So it's actually still accessing the script, even though it's switched off and running it. Now there is still a way that we can uh, stop that from happening when the script is not active. So um, if we go back into our script, into our script two, we can check if this if the script itself is actually active and enabled. So we're going to say if this dot is active and enabled. Uh, and we can actually leave it like that. All right, you could put is equal to true, but in fact, its default is true. So just leaving it like that is the same as saying true. Okay. And then we can encase all of that in there. And that will only run now as long as the script is actually switched on. So if we save that and we try it again, and I right click, the script gets switched off. And now when I left click, obviously I don't get anything. All right, so um, a script generally gets more and more complex as you keep working on it. As you try it out, you find, okay, uh, that didn't quite do what I wanted it to do. So now I've got to find a way, a solution to get it to do what I want it to do. And you'll just keep adding these extra little bits. All right, and before you know it, your script is getting more and more complex. In the last video, we add our ground go green. Okay, and in order to do so, we put in a public variable, uh, a public ball called can destroy that actually shows up in the inspector. So if, for example, you're passing this around a team and there are other people who maybe are working on the same project, they might think, oh, actually, I can just switch that on. And then the item actually gets destroyed immediately, not realizing that that is actually being called by a different script. If you want something to be public and available to other scripts, but not show up in the inspector, you can actually hide it in the inspector. So um, if we go back to our script two, where we see our can destroy, uh, we can simply type in square brackets, hide in inspector. Okay, and it will only work on the item that's immediately below it. If I had four items, it wouldn't hide all four, it would only hide just this one. So. If I, if I did have four items, I would have to press enter after each one and do a hide and inspector on each one. Okay. Uh, if I now save this, we will see that the can destroy has disappeared. Still public, can still be called by the other script. Let's just double check that to make sure it can. So left click, there we go. Right click, that is no longer active. All right. Um, but that's how you hide something in the inspector. Now, public variables can exist in the scripts, but in order to access them from a different script, you need to be able to call it uh, by finding the object. Okay, um, there is a way that you can actually find variables from any script without having to find the object it's attached to. And these are public static variables. So if I type something like public static, uh, and I'll make this as another ball, let's say, and uh, I'll call it, uh, I'll just call it something like trigger for now. I'll make it equal false. Okay, public static balls can exist outside of the script themselves. They actually get placed into the computer's RAM, into its own memory. So they can exist not only outside of the script, they can exist outside of the scene. So as long as you're playing the game, that is actually passed into the actual memory of the computer until you stop playing the game. So you can access that from almost anywhere, which is great. The only issue is it doesn't show up in the inspector. Okay, so it's not there. Now, if I, let's say, 
do in the update I'm going to do a debug debug.log uh, trigger equals plus trigger I want to get that variable I want to see if it's true or false okay and by default it should obviously be false okay that's going to return into the inspector now from the script one all we need to do is basically say the script name and the variable that we want to um, we want to change so let's just comment out this line and let's simply do script to dot uh, trigger equals true okay now as I save that uh, we'll check our console for any messages Okay, we can see that trigger is false until I right click and then trigger is true. So from one script, we've spoken to a second script and we've effectively changed its public static. Now, the only issue with the public static is this particular variable uh, always is kept in memory. So if you have changed it, and then let's say you destroy the object or you destroy the script it's attached to, it's still in memory. So if then you start a new scene and you want to access it again, it doesn't get reset back to false. It's still in its true state. So at that point, you have to something like on the start, when this script gets restarted again, set that trigger back to false again. If you don't do that, that can lead to issues. Uh, public static balls are extremely useful or public static variables, you can have any variable as a public static. Um, they're extremely useful, but you do have to remember to reset them, otherwise you're going to run into trouble. Another common type of component that we quite often see uh, on objects is animator. The animator component uh, that plays all the animations. Now there are a couple of ways that we can do this. So let's, for example, take our cube. We can actually just begin animating the cube in some way. So if we go to Window, uh, Animation and Animation, that will open our animation window, and we can simply just create an animation for this cube. All right, choose where you want it to go. I'll create a new folder just for animations. Uh, and then you can give it a name. It always ends with a dot anim extension. So let's just call it cube test. As soon as you do that, you get access to the timeline. Now, if you just click on these three little dots, at the moment it's based in seconds on mine, it may very well be in frames on yours. So you can choose what, what your time frame is going to be. Um, and this is the name of the actual animation. If you've got multiple animations, you click on this drop down, it will show you all the animations that are actually attached to this object. Well, let's say that, for example, we click record at zero, and what I want to do maybe is just simply rotate and move the object. So if I right click up in the transform and choose add a key, notice that these go red. So it's actually added a keyframe for the rotation. It's recorded that value at zero. Might do the same for position as well. So if I right click and add a key. Now as soon as I've done that I've actually set those particular uh, numbers into this animation. So now it's position sensitive. Okay so if for example I had another cube and it was all the way over here, start to play in the animation, it will instantly jump to that position because of those numbers. Okay. Uh, and then let's say that after one second, so I'll just drag this over to one by clicking this bar up here. Uh, I actually want that to maybe move up, across, maybe even forward. And I also want to maybe rotate around like this. Now what I'm going to get when I press play is some kind of an animation. Now notice it starts and stops and then it kind of jumps back to its original position. Well what we could do, we could just click on these keyframes and copy those. So Control and C. Um, I don't think you get the option of right clicking on there or you can do edit and copy. 
and then if we click on this little arrow to give ourselves more time let's go over to two so I'll just click here and then I do control and V to paste and what we're now going to get is a looping animation so it'll go there and then back there and back because we've got the beginning keyframes and the end keyframes exactly the same okay now let's do another animation so to create another one we simply click there and create a new clip let's call this one still what I want to do with this simply press record and I just want to right click add a key on position right click add a key on rotation I only want it to be one frame all right so it simply doesn't move now as soon as I've done that you will notice that on my cube original it's added this animator component as well as a controller so if you click on this it's added this that is basically powering these animations so if I go to window animation and animator this opens up this window which is where you control all of your animations now it's just middle uh, roller to roll in or out you can click and hold the middle mouse button to actually pan around okay I can left click and drag on these so cube test was the original animation still was the second one when it's orange it means that that is the very first animation it will play I actually want it to be this still so I'm going to right click and choose set as layer default state that becomes the orange now at the moment it will only play this still animation and it won't do anything else okay because there is no transition between this animation and the cube test to set up a transition we just right click choose make transition and just move your mouse I'm not actually clicking and dragging just moving and once it kind of finds a new animation it'll kind of snap to it and you just left click in order to add that and then let's maybe right click on here choose make transition going back and just click now on this transition we can actually click on it it basically says play the animation but there's no conditions for this so it will basically play the still go to the cube test and then it will do the same or play the cube test and go back to the still notice these transitions if I didn't have a transition back what would happen it would play the still it would go straight forward to cube test and then it would get stuck it would just play cube test over and over and over again as long as if I click on here cube test as loop time which basically means it's just going to keep playing it's going to keep looping over and over again if you only want it to play once and stop just make sure you uncheck that okay so let's see what we've got at the moment so if I just press play notice it'll just start animating straight away I don't need to type anything I don't need to make any changes um, but it's just going to do that regardless okay so unless I give it some conditions so in the animator that's where our parameters come in parameters are the conditions in which we can set for the animations and we would add uh, these parameters by clicking on this plus and we'll notice that there are four types of parameters we can have we can have a decimal number a float we can have an integer whole number we can have a boolean true or false and this time we can even have a trigger that will basically fire the animation once and then stop okay so um, let's take a look at how we could use all of these so I'll create a float and I need to give it a name let's just call it float one um, then integer call this int one then a boolean call this ball one and then a trigger okay call this trigger one just so that whoops named it wrong just double click in order to get that correct they're all lowercase at the moment so I know exactly how to uh, write them so we can see that there is a difference in the way in which uh, the way in which they are displayed so a float will allow you then to type decimal numbers 1.5 whereas an integer will not allow you to enter a decimal so you'll end up with 15 okay so let's uh, keep everything at zero at the moment a boolean can either be checked or unchecked and a trigger can only be checked once and then as soon as it's run it then goes back to not being checked 
Okay, um, so let's say that from the still to the cube test, I'm going to start with the float. I simply want to say float one, I can do either is greater than or less than. So let's say it's greater than um, 1.5. If that's the case, it can then move from still to cube test. Let's say going back, we're going to say if float one is uh, in fact, I'm going to say is greater than 2.5. Okay, so it's going to get stuck on cube test for a while until I make that float one at least 1.5 uh, or at least one greater, and then it will come back to still. Okay, now if it's still greater than 1.5, it's going to instantly start cycling around like that, it's going to kind of float around. So let's take a look at how we can actually write this in code. So um, this is on the cube original, which already has a script of script one. So let's use script one. In the update, uh, I'm just going to basically get rid of all of this and get mouse down number one. I'm going to say public of type animator I'm going to call it anim I usually do okay um, and then I'm also going to have a float variable okay so public float that I will call my float make that equal 0, 0 0.0 to begin with so now I'm going to say if input get mouse button down one I'm going to say my float uh, plus equals 0 0.5. Each time that I click it, it's going to make it 0 0.5 bigger. Then I'm going to say anim dot set float. Okay, so in other words, that means I'm going to change that float value that's in the animator. It needs to know the name of the float uh, or the um, actual item, so it's ID, and then the actual value. So the ID, if you remember, was this, float1. So it has to be spelled exactly the same. So float1. And the number that I want to pass in, instead of actually hard coding the number, I'm going to pass in my float. All right, that's it. Uh, so if we now press save, wait for this to update. Now we're going to notice in our script that we need an animator, so that's this. So we're just going to drag the animator into there, and the my float is currently at zero. So let's go into the game. Let's now press play. So if I right click, my float has gone up to 0 0.5. Right click again, it's now 1. Right click again, it's 1.5. The next time I right click, it should animate. So there we go, started to animate. If I right click again, 2.5, right click again, it should go back to still, but it'll continue to float through. Okay, notice now it goes still for a second and then it kind of animates. That's because my float is currently at three. Both conditions are now being met. Both this condition, which is greater than 1.5, and this condition is greater than 2.5, so it's now in a cycle. So in the script, I could say um, if my float is less than three, then keep adding this number to it. And then I'm going to say else uh, my float equals zero. So we'll reset it. Okay, so we're effectively putting a cap on there so that when I go over three, it will instantly become zero again. That should technically stop this animation. So let's find out again and see how, see if this works. So at the moment, no animation because my float is on zero. Right click, right click, right click once again, and it should start animating. I'm on two. 2.5, 3, now it will play the other animation. Now right click again and it becomes zero and it stops the animation. 
So notice with a little bit of script, I can now completely control this animation. I can control which animation state it's in, and when the transitions are actually taking place. Okay, so I've got a little bit of a task for you. I want you to have a go at doing the integer next. Okay, in very similar way, uh, but instead of doing the set float, see if you can figure out how to actually set that item. So how did you get on with that task? Hopefully now you've got it working. Uh, so I've simply changed my um, transition. So now it says int one, which is my integer is greater than one. Int one is greater than two. Okay, and then in the script, simply added a new public integer called my int, which starts at zero. And then because it is an integer, I've said if my int is less than three, my int plus equals one, else my int equals zero. And then to actually set an integer, it is just anim.set integer. All right, so if you figured out how to do that, that's great. Uh, the actual name of the integer is int one. Okay, and the value I want to pass into it is my integer, or my int rather. Um, so let's now test this out. So if I right click, nothing, right click again, I should get the animation. It's just that one, right click again. Now it should pause and then go and then right click again and it just stops. Okay, so it's exactly the same as the float, only this time we're using whole numbers. Okay, so what about uh, the Boolean then? All right, so um, let's click on this one and let's choose bool one. We only have two options. It can either be true or false. So let's say if it's true, it will go to cube test. If bool one is false, it will go back to still. Okay, now generally um, this is used when you only want one state or the other so it's usually only used when uh, you've got like your two animations and you simply wanted to transition between the the two of them if you've got lots and lots of animations the ball isn't as effective as something like float or an integer that can allow you then to pass through many many different um, animations to get to where you need to go so let's use a, a ball then so let's declare a new ball so public of type bool, I'll call my bool. Uh, let's make it equal to false to begin with. Okay, and then simply we're gonna say, we don't need if, any of this if or in uh, else in here at the moment. Anyway, we're gonna say, um, when we input this, my bool equals true. And then we're gonna do set bool. Now for a set ball, we don't need to pass any other information in. We just simply, um, or rather we don't pass data information in, we need it either true or false. Okay, so that's gonna be my ball that's gonna get passed into there. Then we need the actual name of the ball itself. So ball one. So the data that you're passing in needs to be in boolean format you can't pass in like integers or float data okay so anim set ball let's try that now now i will only go up to cube test at the moment so let's try that so at the moment it's completely still until i right click and then it starts to instantly play this okay now let's do a check so I can say if my ball is equal to false, my ball equals true, okay. And then I'm gonna say else if my ball is equal to true, my ball equals false. So that um, each time that I click this, the first time it's gonna be true, the second time it's gonna return it back to false. Okay. Um, 
so that should work fine. Uh, now let's try this. And we want to keep an eye on this checkbox here. So at the moment it's false. So if I right click, now it's true. And if I right click again, it becomes false and it stops the animation. Excellent. All right, that's great. Um, so both can be extremely powerful. I use it quite a lot myself with animations. Um, now we've got the trigger. Trigger will effectively fire an animation and then allow it to go back to where it started. So for trigger, all we need to do is just access it. There's no extra conditions. It simply means that trigger has been fired. What I want to do here is make sure that my exit time is unchecked. Now this is only a one frame animation, so it's not necessarily too important, but if this animation lasted like 30 seconds and we left as exit time checked, even though we've triggered another animation, if, if that is checked, it's still got to play the entire 30 seconds before it can go to the next animation. But if you uncheck that as exit time, no matter where it is in the animation, it will instantly jump to the next animation. So that's quite important. On the way back, we actually don't want any conditions. So if I just click here and press minus, just make sure that it does have exit time. If, if you uncheck that, you're going to get an, uh, this warning saying it needs either a condition or exit time. You can't have not both. Um, so as exit time allows that animation to completely play before going back to the still animation. Okay, so uh, for a trigger, um, we actually don't need any of that at the moment. Okay, and in fact, we don't need any variables for this. We're simply going to say set trigger. And the trigger name, I believe, was trigger one. Yep, all lowercase. We don't need to pass in any data. So all we're going to say is trigger one. And that's it. That's basically going to fire that trigger every time. So let's try this now. So right click and it's going to play, but then it's going to stop. It's not going to flow through it because I have to manually trigger that animation. If I just keep right clicking, it might play through a few times now. Okay, there we go. Right click, right click. This could be useful, for example, in something like a fighting game where you want the character to punch, but you only want the punch to happen when you fire. After he's done punching, it just goes back to idle again. So a trigger can be really useful for those kind of things. Okay, and that's our four types of parameters. Uh, in the next video, we'll take a look at how we could potentially use something like this to make something a little bit more complex in terms of our animations. So now we want to take a look at something that's just a little bit more complex with the animations. The first thing I want to do is give my cube a new material. So I'll go into my materials folder, I've got green and orange. I might actually just use this orange. Okay, so on my cube original, I'm going to find my mesh renderer and just drag the orange directly onto there. Okay, now what I can do, I can actually animate any of these elements that exist in the material. I actually want to change its color over time. So on the cube original, I can now go to window, animation, animation. Uh, and let's just create a new animation clip. Let's make sure we're putting it into the right place which is animations, and I'll call this a uh, material change or something like that. Okay, so I want to record. So what I want to change is the color. So first thing, I'll just right click, add a key. That will then allow me to change anything on the material. And let's go over to about one second. Let's just click on the, uh, in fact, actually let me go over to two seconds, if I can. So using my roller on my mouse, I'm just going to roll out to get to squash this all together. Go to two seconds. Now once once again, want to right click and add a key. 
Now it will basically animate between two constants, so you're not going to see any change. At one second, I actually want to come into this color chip here and change it maybe to a green. Okay, so now what we're going to notice is that that is then just going to change color. Ah, now the color itself, the material color is set there and there, so I actually want to take just this one um, keyframe and do a control and C, come over here, and control and V. So it goes back to orange. There we go. And obviously you, you can get it to change as many colors as you like. So for example, I could come here to 0 0.3. I could get it to change maybe to a blue color. And then over here, I could then change it maybe to like a red or a pink color or something. So that now it will completely change color and almost very, very quickly as well, which is a little strange, isn't it? But um, yeah, Let, let's get it to do that. Now over in our animator, that new animation has been added, okay, but it has no transitions, it has, it's not linked to anything. You can also click on this and notice in the inspector I've got a whole bunch of things that I can change, one of which is speed. If I felt that that was too fast before what was happening, I can actually slow this down. So I can go maybe 0 0.5, half speed, so now it will look much better. Let's say that, for example, if float one on this one, let, let me go back to float one, is greater than 1.5, let's say. That's fine. And then from cube test, I could right click, make a transition over to material change, and say if float one is greater than two, let's say, it will then instantly go up there. From there, I could have two transitions. I could have a transition that comes back here that says if float one is greater than uh, 2.5, I can also have a transition coming back to still that says if float one is less than 0 0.5 okay so now it's got two ways in which that can travel but it's only got one way in which to get to it from the still it needs to go to cube test in order to get to material change okay it can't go directly from still to material change so the order in which you do these kind of um, transitions is extremely important from cube test coming back down to still I'm going to say if float one is less than 0 0.5 again. Now remember on these, when we're changing these, we've still got this as exit time. Well, I actually want to take those off on all of those. Okay. Um, this one as well, so that it will instantly change these items. Now I just want to take my animator and dock it over on this side and uh, I'm just going to kind of zoom out a little bit so that we can kind of see this and as long as I've got my cube selected okay we should be able to see the actual transitioning of these uh, particular clips okay now in the script I do need to make that change so we are using a float aren't we so I'm simply going to say um, if my float is greater than three, my float equals uh, zero. I'm going to say else my float plus equals zero point five each time. Okay, and then obviously we need to set the animator as well. So we're going to say anim dot set float. The float was called float one, and the data that we want to pass in is my float. Okay, so very easy. Save that. 
Now we're going to watch this um, watch this cube and we're also going to watch these animations. So make sure that you click on cube original. Uh, that way this will be um, relevant when you click play. If you've clicked on something else, even though that's still technically there, you're not clicking on the object that this is related to. So you're not going to see any kind of um, real time updates. So if I now click play, okay, we're going to see this little blue line showing which animation it's currently on. It's on still. As soon as I right click, nothing happens, but notice I'm now at 0 0.5. Right click again, still nothing. Right click again, still nothing. Right click again, now it's gone to cube test. It's running on that one, okay? If I right click again, now it's gone to material change. Right click again, it's on three. Now it's moving between these and it looks kind of crazy. Right click again, right click again, it's gone on to zero, so it's gone right back to still. All right, so this is actually a great way to actually preview your animations and your animator to see what state it's currently in, how it's traveling uh, between these transitions in order to find out if there are any issues or is it working the way that you want it to. And from here, you can actually continue to add animations and build up the complexity. Now we can actually add the animations um, to any object. Okay, so for example, we could take the animations from the cube and apply them to the plane. So I'm just gonna drag this back over here. Um, however, it would need its own component. So we click add component of type animator uh, and make sure it's not this old legacy animation that was from way, way back. That was way before Unity 5. We need this one as the two little arrows. Okay, and then it always needs some kind of a controller. The controller is what gets you into this animator tab. It's all of this material, all of this data in here. Okay, so we can click on this and we've got the cube original. And now it's effectively gonna do the same things to the ground as it is to the actual cube. Let's see what we actually get. Okay, so <laughs> the ground is actually up there. I can see from the shadow, if I now Right click a few times. There we go. The ground is actually moving. It's just, I can't see it through the camera. And then it goes right back to this one and back to this one and then this one. Uh, so let me just take my main camera, maybe just move it way up here like this. Uh, yep. Okay. So in the main camera, in the click game object, align with view. So now through in my game view, we can see it here. So instantly it moved up. Ah, now the, the ground is not moving along with the cube, which is interesting. And it's also not changing color either. Okay, so if I click on play, go to window, animation, animation, and Nope, it's all showing as being perfectly fine. Showing the plane position and the plane rotation. It should be animating like that, but for some reason it's not. Okay, which is interesting. And I, I know why, uh, because on the plane, it has a script two. On the cube, it has a script one. So that's the reason why. Uh, so what I could do here on my script one is right click, copy this component over on plane, get rid of the script two. So remove that component, go up to transform, right click, paste, component as new. Now I've got a script one and I want the animator directly from this plane. Make sure I'm using that animator. Let's try it again now. There we go. Now they're both moving together. And now they're both changing colors. And then, yep. And then it goes back to that. All right, so animations can be used on multiple objects. You just have to make sure that it's accessing the correct animator. 
there is a chance that you might actually get the wrong animator or it might be set wrong. So instead of actually clicking and dragging that, it is more effective for you to set this in the start. So I could simply do a void start and I could say anim equals get component animator. And now we'll instantly get the correct animator from wherever the script is attached to. Okay, that's much more effective than actually dragging it in there. Once you've done that, it doesn't need to be public. It can actually be a private animator. All right, so you don't make any kind of mistakes. Uh, and that will still work perfectly fine, just to prove this. And there we go. All right, so they're both kind of animating. Not the best animation in the world, but it just kind of proves the point. Another common component that we could use is particle effects. Um, so you will find in the resources for this session that I've given you a text file called particles. It's got a web address for the Unity Asset Store. So if you just want to copy that into your web browser, uh, it's the hit impact effects free by Travis Game Assets. All right, so it's just a, it's kind of a sample of a full pack. It's completely free. Um, it's around 4.6 megabytes, uh, but these are very, very common in games. So to work with this, first of all, um, let's just go back into Unity. Uh, make sure that you're signed in. All right, if not, just go to edit and sign in. If you don't yet have a Unity ID, like you don't have a, you know, login details and password, just create them uh, through the edit and sign in. So when you click sign in, just register, it's completely free. Uh, and then you will also need to sign in on the website as well. Okay, so just here and click sign in and then basically the two are then linked. So now I'm simply gonna click add to my assets. I have to agree to their terms and conditions. And then uh, it will ask me if I wanna open this in Unity. Yep, so open this in Unity, see if it will actually load up Unity. Um, if it doesn't, then just go back into Unity. It's called Hit Impact Free. Uh, if it did work, it will basically come through to Window. It will open the Package Manager. Okay, uh, and I wanna go to My Assets. This is where you've got all of your saved assets. Um, Refreshing, okay, so the one that I want is the hit impacts. There we are, it impacts free. And then from here, I can then just download that and actually install it. So just give that a second to download. Then I'm simply gonna click import. It will show me everything that's actually part of this package. Now I can see that there's no scripts on here. Oh, there is. Oh, no, there isn't. Yeah, there is. It, it impact pre, effects preview CS. Okay, that's the only script. So I'm going to import this and uh, that will install. Okay, now that it's installed, you should be able to find that. Uh, it's in Travis Games folder, hit impact, and we've got all sorts of stuff, including a demo scene. It's got a script here, so. It all looks pretty basic stuff. All right, good, nothing too complex. Um, so if you wanna check any of these out, just go into prefabs and hits. Now what we can do in our scene view, simply drag one of these into the world and you'll actually see it play. So if I just click play, now, it's not that obvious at the moment, let's just a little bit closer and you can kind of see what it's doing there. Um, yeah, all right. So to preview it, you just drag it into the world. You've got hit two, <laughs> that one's kind of small. Uh, yeah, so feel free to preview those. Um, I'm just gonna save this scene because we do also have a pre-made scene as part of this pack. So let's just double click to open. So throw in the game scene, if we press play now should have a, a bunch of stuff. 
All right, so this is this first one, which looks pretty good. Um, a or D to switch effects, so let's go to number two. I kind of like this one, actually, so I think I'm going to go with the number two one. Yep, so some really nice effects going on here. Whoa. And I think that's taking me back to number one, I think. Yep, it has. All right. So, um, particle pool, hit number two was the one that I liked. Okay. So let me find where they are. So in the prefabs, hit, hit number two was the one that I quite liked. Yep, that's the one. All right, good. So I'm going to go back to my main scene again. So that's scripting basics. No, nope, we don't have to save that. Uh, and what we want to do now is effectively talk to this uh, these particles with our script. So first of all, uh, in Travis Games, hit impact uh, and the prefabs hit. So I want hit number two. I actually want that to be parented to my cube. So what I can do, take my hit 02, drag it onto the cube original, and then just simply take the X, Y, and Z and make those zero. And that will then put it into the exact same spot as the actual cube. Now I might want it to be slightly in front, so I can always drag that out in front. And by the way, these little icons that we're seeing are shurikens, because this is a shuriken based effect. What it has, is particle here it has some spark particles which you can play independently to see what they look like we have various other particles that play in we even have a haze flash and obviously we play the entire thing together and you get the entire uh, piece so you get a multiple set of particles basically um, now when you're looking at your particles Obviously in the inspector, it's showing you all sorts of things that you can actually change. One of which is play on awake. So as soon as this plays, it's gonna, uh, or as soon as this is switched on, it's instantly gonna play. Okay, it's gonna last for around 0 0.75 seconds and it's gonna be running at a speed of one. So if I wanted to speed that up or slow it down, I would change this one. Uh, if I want it to last longer, I would change duration. I didn't want it to play immediately, but whenever I call it in script, I would uncheck this play on awake. Okay. It's also going to only uh, produce one, one count in one cycle. All right. Uh, and obviously each item underneath might have different settings. So feel free just to check through them. These, uh, these two last for one second. Okay, so now that we actually have that, what I'm gonna do is actually switch the item off. Okay, and then in my script, I can then open the script. Wait for this to open. Uh, and I can associate it as a game object that can simply be switched on and off. All right, that's probably the easiest way to actually get particles working. So in the script, I can simply say uh, public, Type game object, call it a uh, particle object. Under the start, I might want to switch that off. Okay, so I'll say particle object dot set active to false. That basically means it's switched off. And then maybe when I left click, I could then say particle object dot set active to true. Simply just switch it on. Now because it's play on awake, so as soon as I left click, it will instantly begin to play. So let's try that. So I'll wait for that to update. And now I've got a little slot for the game object, so I'll just drag this hit zero two into there. And let's now press play. So when I left click, there we go. Oh, could just see it, but the ground is kind of in the way. So on the ground, I'm just going to right click and remove the animator, right click and remove the script. And let's try it again. 
now when I left click, there we go, you can see the particle and ooh, actually it's destroyed itself, which is interesting. So if we click on here, um, is it telling it to stop action is on destroy. So in other words, once it's played immediately, destroy the object. I'm going to get it to simply disable. All right, which basically means just switch itself back off again. Uh, that's on none. That's on none. And that's also on none. All right, good. Let's try it again and see what happens. There we go. It's grayed back out again. So I can just keep switching it back on and off as long as I want. So once it's finished, it will just simply uh, disable itself under the stop action. All right, which is great. Uh, I'm getting an error about the broadcast message, but that's because I don't have the other script running. Okay, what if, for example, we wanted it not to have play on awake and for it to be switched on originally? Okay, so if I go through all of them and just make sure none of them are on play on awake, which they're not, good. And I play it now, notice nothing happens. Okay, so even when I switch it on, nothing happens. We can now call that particle um, to play through the script. So what we need is a particle system. So public of type particle system. And now we'll call this, uh, We'll simply call it particles, okay? Uh, and then under the input down, once I've made the particle object true, I can simply say particles dot play. All right, very easy. It's very much like doing the sounds with the audio. You can even do particles dot stop if you want. Let's check it out now. Wait a second, I didn't associate my particles. Uh, that's why it's not working. <laughs> Let's drag in our particle system. Here we go. There we go, it played. Switch it back on and it played. So now it's effectively calling it by script. Uh, if we do this particle set active to true, if I comment that out and comment out the false, false as well. So in words they're always switched on we can still call this. Uh, now notice under the particles, once they finish, they disable. So I need to change that to something like none. Okay, now I can call them as many times as I like. Just totally get that and nothing happens. All right, they stay always on whenever I actually want to call those. Uh, we've got something called looping as well that would effectively get them to loop. Now I believe that this is only going to affect the parent object and it's not going to affect the children. All right, so well let's try it. So I could say particles dot. Let me see if I can access loop. I can. Loop equals true. And now I've got a green system. Particles dot main loop. Uh, main dot loop. Let's see if that would work. It's, that was the advice it just gave me, and that's uh, that didn't work. Okay, well, it should still work, even though uh, it's come, come up with green saying that that is an obsolete term. Um, but, you know, it should, should still work. So, it's still valid code. Let's try it now. So, we're going to watch that little loop button. All right, and now it's showing it's looping. And there we go. If we take a look at this, I'll just get a little bit closer. You can actually see it completely looping all the time, over and over. Um, notice that the child objects, however, are not. Okay. 
You could set them up as an array and then simply go through them and cause them all to loop. All right. Um, so you can access almost anything through here. I could change the duration. I could change the start delay. I could let's uh, let's have a go at changing the simulation speed. And bear in mind, it's only the parent object that's going to change. So I could say particles dot speed. Let me see. Uh, simulation speed, got playback speed. Here we go. Uh, equals, let's say, three. Once again, it's telling me that it's um, an obsolete term that you would most likely use uh, main dot simulation speed instead. Okay, um, this should still work perfectly fine. All right, take a look now. It's obviously going a lot faster because the speed has now become three. So it's extremely easy to actually manipulate most of these components. You just find something in the inspector that you want to manipulate in code and then simply go in the code, find your main variable, put in a dot, and then you call whatever it is you want and change that value. So now we're going to move on to uh, looking at the UI or the user interface. So for now, I'm just going to save this scene and then I'm going to go to file, new scene. Let's create a new scene. Okay, I'll save this one. So file, save as, uh, I'll save it into the scenes folder and I'll call it um, UI basics. Um, you don't have permission to modify the files in this network location. Oh, that's unusual. Uh, but that's created it for me anyway. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, what we want to do now is basically focus on the UI. So this is basically any kind of text, images, or sprites that are going to belong on your screen, but are not 3D objects. Generally, UI is mostly 2D. Uh, so it might be something like a health bar, it might be a timer, it might be stats, it might be uh, an image or some uh, like a note that you have to read or something. Uh, so by default, we don't have any kind of UI in our scene. So if we go to game object and we take a look at our UI section, we've got all sorts of stuff we can put on there, but everything in the UI must exist on the canvas. So if we put in a new canvas, we've now got the ability to actually include UI. Okay, and this uh, comes in a standard as well as an event system. The event system allows you to actually interact with the UI, to click on items and to make things work. Okay, uh, on the canvas, at the moment we're doing screen space overlay. This means whatever gets rendered in the camera, this UI is going to be overlaid over that. So it's going to appear over it. We do have a few options. We could do screen space on a specific camera. That's if you've got two or three cameras rendering and you want the UI only to show on one or two of those cameras. We could do world space. So the UI could effectively become 3D and exist, let's say, over a character's head. Maybe you've got an health bar, like in an RPG game that appears over a character's head you would do it in world space. But for now, we're gonna stay in screen space overlay. Uh, you also have the option of just keeping it at a constant pixel size. This means that if your screen resolution changes, your UI doesn't, it stays at the exact same size. So if it's pretty big to begin with and the screen gets smaller, you're gonna see some clipping of your UI. You're, not, you're gonna miss some of it. And if it starts out small, but your screen gets bigger, your UI is still going to be absolutely tiny. You can, however, change it so that it scales with screen size, or you can have it based on a constant physical size. So imagine, for example, if you wanted it exactly at 1920 by 1080 and never to change, you could do that. Okay, most likely you would probably scale with screen size and you put in a reference resolution for it to start at. Let's say 1920 by 1080. So that it's full HD. 
and then you can match the width or height of the screen. If you just leave it on width, that should be fine. And then from up here where, about, where it's free aspect at the moment, we can change this so that it takes on the full HD 1920 by 1080. Now on our canvas, if we right click, choose something like UI and put in a new panel, see this happens, it kind of goes this kind of grayish color and that's because it's actually white but the alpha is all the way down here at 100. Okay, if we increase that then we're going to get it totally opaque, you won't see anything behind there. If we drag it all the way down to the bottom it's completely invisible and we can put items on there. Let's get it so that it's completely white. Okay, then uh, let's go to the canvas, right click, let's choose UI. I could put in something like a button. Uh, now we have something called Text Mesh Pro or we have Legacy Text. I'm going to start by showing you how to use Legacy Text and then we're going to uh, move over to Text Mesh Pro. So uh, there's our button with Text Mesh Pro or under Legacy we can go with the traditional button. So if I click this it will add a little button right in the middle there. Okay, um, with this button, I can move it around by using these items, or I could go into the scene view, switch over to 2D, and double click on the button to see where it is. If I scroll out a bit so that I can see my full window, I could then use my traditional move tools to move that button wherever I like. Uh, these items that you see in here are the anchors. For this button so that will anchor it to that position on the screen that comes from here if i anchor it let's say to the top left notice that thing is now changed up there it will always anchor the, to the top left so if the resolution changes let's say the button will always try and stay that that exact distance from the corner okay so it's pretty small at the moment, let's maybe make it just a little bit bigger. So instead of 160 width, let's set it about 240 width. Height, let's set it about 75. So it's a pretty big button now. Um, you can change how this button interacts. At the moment, it's based on the color tint when you hover your mouse over it. But you could also uh, swap its sprite and you could also give it an animation. Let's just keep it on color tint. It's normal color. I'm going to change this so that maybe it's like a green color. When it's highlighted, I want it to change to something like an orange. When it's pressed, I might have it so it goes red. And when it's selected, I might have it go uh, roughly about the same green color. And when it's disabled, it will be grayed out. Okay, so let me just save my scene now. So if I play, and hover over the button, notice it now changes colors. So it interacts by default. I didn't have to do anything there. And when I click it, obviously you'll see the colors change. Okay, so that's all inbuilt. Now in order for you to interact with the button, you do need to ensure that it has Raycast. If it's not a Raycast target, it means it won't be listening for a mouse press. So, ooh, actually that is still working, which is interesting probably because I've got the interactable set up there. If I move that off, I think the interactable pretty much makes it a Raycast target anyway. Okay, um, so let's get this button to maybe do something based on this on click. In the scripts folder, I'm gonna right click, choose create a new C sharp script. And I'm gonna call this uh, UI basics. Let's open this script. Okay, so in the UI basics, whenever we're talking to um, something in the UI, it's a good idea to give it that namespace. Since there's a lot of items in the UI that are not part of these collections. So we say using Unity Engine dot UI. Okay, that's going to be useful later. Uh, for the moment, all we need is a new custom function. So let's say public void, uh, let's call it clicked. 
And all I'm going to do there is say debug.log. I have been clicked. Now at the moment that function is never being called from the internal functions. So it'll never run, but we're going to call it from the button. So if I save it now, you know, attach this directly to the canvas. You can attach it to absolutely any object, by the way. Uh, and on the button, where we get our on click, what I'm going to do is click plus, and then I'm going to drag the canvas into this section, because then it's going to recognize that it's got a script on it. From here, we're going to go to our UI basic script. We've got a whole bunch of stuff, and we'll go through these in a second. And there's my function clicked. So now, whenever I click that button, it knows to run that function. So in the console, but now I'll press play. Absolutely nothing at the moment, but then I have been clicked. All right, so I'm making that script work whenever I click on the button. All right, excellent. Now, let's take a look at what else we have. So first of all, we could access it as a game object, and we could do something like broadcast a message, and we could type in a specific string. So that could broadcast a message to any object that is either on the button or a child of the button. All right, that's one way. Uh, we could do set active bool. So at the moment, it's going to be switched off. All right, so if, for example, I play this and I click on the button, notice, ooh, it's actually going to switch the canvas off. So it's whatever the object is, is the script is on the canvas. That's why it's switching that off. If we put the script on the button itself, it will switch the button off. Okay, rect transform is technically the size of this button. Uh, so we could do various things with that. The canvas itself, we could do various things with this. Now, some of it can be a little bit advanced at that point, but some of it is really basic, like just switching it on or off. Having a plane distance, how far is it away from the actual camera? You would do that if it's almost in 3D space, almost. Canvas scaler, you can change the scale of the canvas. Graphics raycaster, we'll get into that later, into raycasting. And then finally on our script, we can actually switch our script on or off. Okay, so let's take a look at this then, at our script, our UI basics. When I click, notice it switched the script off. All right, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can actually do here. Um, we can, let's say, once again, we can broadcast a message. If we've got any invokes running, we can cancel those or cancel all invokes. We can send messages. If we've got any coroutines running, we can stop all coroutines. But most likely, you will just want to run your own functions. And that way, you've got complete control over this. Uh, the text that's currently on there, we can easily change that as well. Let's call it my button and we could make the font size a lot bigger. Uh, you could even change the font size. Let's have a look, but we've only got Arial at the moment. I'll show you how to bring in other fonts shortly. Um, the alignment, we can change that, etc. Now at the moment it has Raycast targeting on the text itself. Normally you would want to uncheck that so that the text does not interfere with the button. It makes it easier for you to then click on the button. Okay, so that's working with buttons. Um, what we'll do in the next video is take a look at how do we actually change the font on these buttons. So now you will find in the resources for this session that uh, there is a text file called free fonts. So it's got a link to uh, a font that we're going to be using. So if you just want to paste that into your web browser, uh, it's 1001fonts.com, which is a great website to use that you can find uh, fonts that are freely commercially available. So in other words, they're free to use even in commercial projects, such as this one called Great Vibes. It's free for commercial use. And it's, uh, you know, totally royalty free, which is great.
Um, so there's hundreds and hundreds of fonts. In fact, there's probably a thousand and one fonts according to the name. So there's all sorts that you can actually do with this. Feel free just to download that font. I've already done that. So I've got the zip file. So I'm just going to open this. And it's the TTF file that we want. So just drag that onto your desktop. Uh, inside of Unity, it's then just a case of dragging that into a folder. So I'll create, right click create a new folder, I'll simply call it UI so that we can keep all UI elements in here. And then just drag that font directly into there, it recognizes it as a font file and it's all set up for us. Okay, so now in the text for my button, all you have to do is drag this font into that section there automatically uses it. All right, so it's really, really good. Maybe make this just a little bit bigger. If you do notice as you're dragging it up and it kind of disappears, that's because it's larger now than the actual space it's got to fill. All right, so make sure you don't go beyond that. If you do need to make it kind of larger, uh, the space, then you would need to go to width and height on this particular object and make it bigger so that you get more space for your uh, text. Now at the moment it's called my button, but what if we wanted to change it to something else using a script? Okay, so let's go back to our script. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is get access to that text itself. So public of type text. Uh, if this isn't turning green, it'll be because that's not written in there. It needs that UI in order to understand this text. Uh, and I'll call it uh, button text. Uh, then uh, let's have public string and I'll call it um, name. Okay, um, and by default, I'll have that say this button instead of my button. So now uh, oh, it doesn't like name because it's probably very similar to um, an internal thing. So I'll call it uh, call it my name. All right, that should sort any issues out there. So now, when it's clicked, what we can say is button text, and we want to access its text property. So that's dot text equals my name. And that's it. That's how easy it is to actually change text. Uh, so what we did there was we said this text object, we want to actually access its text, this particular little section here. So this text object, we want to access its text box and we want to change it to whatever that string is saying, this button. So now on our canvas, we're going to have uh, button text that requires some text so let's drag that in now it recognizes it and let's change this maybe we could call it uh just call it with a capital g green okay so now when i press play click on the button and now the text changes all right so it's really easy right um now let's take a look at using text mesh pro all right, so we've used our text legacy. Now, in order to use Text Mesh Pro, I believe we can either go through the component and, uh, or rather the window and the package manager and set it up. We can go to edit and project settings and go to our Text Mesh Pro and set it up from here. Or we can go to canvas, right click UI, and put in a button with Text Mesh Pro, which will automatically do the same thing. So what you have to do the first time you're running Text Mesh Pro, you have to import TMP Essentials. So click that and it will import all sorts of stuff it needs in order to run. All right, there we go. Uh, we don't need the examples or the extras. So now we've got another button that looks exactly like this one. But this time the text is saying TMP, Text Mesh Pro. And we're going to see that we've got a whole bunch more formatting options. And we'll go through these in a second. Um, so it's just 
a little bit more advanced effectively. So once again, let's just change the width on this to maybe about 200. Let's change the height to like uh, 65. And the Text Mesh Pro, let's just get it say, um, I'll get it to say TMP so that we know it's Text Mesh Pro. The button acts exactly the same. So we've got a color tint again. Let's maybe set the normal color of this to like a, a nice sort of orange, maybe highlight color. We could have as like a yellow pressed color. We could have as like maybe a blue. Selected color, I would just like this color. That's a terrible selection of colors, by the way. Um, and we've also got the on click functionality again. So, what we could do there, we could take our canvas once we've done this, take our canvas, and once again, we can run that UI basics and clicked. Okay, uh, the only issue here is going to be the text. So when we click this, presumably this text is going to change. So if, for example, I hover over this, yeah, it changes this text. Uh, so what we effectively want to do is change this text. So if I go back into Canvas, where I've got button text, and I try dragging this text into there, we've got a little forbidden symbol that says you can't do that. The reason why? different type of text. So first of all, we need to tell Unity that we're using Text Mesh Pro. So we're using, and I believe it's Unity Engine dot Text Mesh Pro. Oh, it's not. Okay. Using Text Mesh TMP Pro. There we go. And as soon as I've told it that I'm using Text Mesh Pro, I should now be able to get access to Text Mesh Pro text. And I can change this text to TMP Pro text. Okay, so TMP, oh, TMP text rather, TMP underlined uh, underscore text. Now this button text will effectively become Text Mesh Pro text. Don't have to do anything with that. That is exactly the same. It's just the actual uh, type that needs to be changed. So now when I save this, you'll notice this now is looking for TMP text. So if I drag this Text Mesh Pro text in, it will recognize it. All right, so now if I press play again, and I click on this, this changes to green. This one is now unaffected. And because I'm using the basic text in there, the, the basic kind of font, and I want to be using a different font, I can't actually drag that into there. Okay, so what I effectively want to do here is convert this into Text Mesh Pro uh, font, which should be under text. Text Mesh Pro, Font Asset Creator, and then let's drag in our font, auto sizing, etc. Generate a font atlas and click, uh, I'll click Save As so that I can give it a different name. Uh, yeah, that'll be fine. Save that and there we go. Okay, so now we've got our Text Mesh Pro version of that particular font. So let's now drag this one in, great vibes, and there we go. All right, so now we're using this, which looks terrible as TMP. So let's call it um, orange. You can now make the font size a little bit bigger so that you can see that. Maybe give it, oh, I've spelled orange wrong, that's why. <laughs> Um, capital O, orange, there we go. Uh, and then from here, we can obviously make it bold or we can make it italic and give it underline, strike through, we can have lower, all lowercase, all uppercase, small caps, etc. Um, the actual vertex color of the text itself, we can change that. So if we wanted it to be white, for example, can do that. We can even add a color gradient to it. 
and you can have up to four different colors which is pretty interesting and then we get this bizarre kind of a uh, bizarre kind of color going on there um, we've got various alignment options and then what's great about this is we can even add something like an outline so if I add outline thickness see that I can get a nice kind of outline going on on my text change the outline color we can get something like a, an underlay going on here uh, offset X offset Y softness so it almost give me like a shadow um, we can get various lighting options so we can give it something like a bevel so we've got all sorts of light options so feel free to experiment with these you can even give it like an outer glow that's interesting with the green glow that looks quite nice and now if we try actually playing through this clicking on the button and it changes to green and it keeps all of those settings as well on the text. Now we want to take a look at UI images. So you'll see a folder in the resources for this session called UI images that just has three space related images in there. So um, I'm going to bring this entire folder into Unity. So we've got a space background, uh, then we've got uh, two characters that are meant to have transparent backgrounds. Now at the moment it's brought it in as a default texture type. I could just click alpha is transparency and that will give me my alpha back. But I actually want this to be a UI image. So when you want it to be a UI image, it's necessary to, uh, to change the texture type to sprite 2D and UI. I click apply now I get my transparency back it's the correct size image and it can be used as a sprite okay the sprite is right there that's effectively what I'm going to use so I'm going to do the same with this sprite 2d and UI click apply and there we go also I'm going to do the same with this background texture as well so sprite 2d and UI click apply all right and it just gives it its correct size and everything um, and allows me to use it as a UI image. So now on my panel, the background, I've got my source image, which is just background. I can actually change this for PNG space. Okay, and now suddenly I've got a space related background. If I click set native size, it's going to make it smaller, uh, which because this is only 512 by 512. So uh, maybe I don't want to do that. So I'll just do edit and undo set native size. Um, so it is kind of stretched out a little bit. Uh, button legacy, I don't think I need that. So I'm just going to delete that. Got my button text. So I want to make, I want to put this right down at the bottom here. And maybe make this a lot bigger so that I can see it. So width about uh, 300 and my height about 120. Yep, so I can definitely see that. Uh, the text. Uh, I want to make the font size a lot bigger. Okay, and I just want to bring this down just a little bit. So where it says top, I'll just drag this down a bit in order to get it lined up. Uh, and I'll start with green because the character is green to begin with. So green. Uh, I also want the text itself to be white. So let's go and find the text. Uh, I think I've got a glow on there. I'm just going to get rid of the glow. Lighting, I'm going to get rid of that. The underlay, get rid of that. Outline, I'll get rid of that. Just so that we can see it's just very, very basic kind of text. Okay, um, so let's bring in the graphics then. So on canvas, I'm going to right click, choose UI, just a new image, gets added to here. Now I can drag my image into the source image and then choose set native size. It's pretty big. I'll sort of drag him up here a little bit, maybe over just to the left, just a little bit. Uh, now I don't want this to be a Raycast target. That means, is this object clickable? Can you interact with it? It's only an image, so I'm gonna uncheck that. 
Now what effectively I want to do with this image is change its source image, which is based on a sprite, um, whenever I click on this button. I want it to change over to this blue guy. Okay, so first of all, let me just rename this image as uh, Space Alien, maybe. Okay, and then take a look at my script. So um, I need a public type of image and I'll call it um, Space Alien or something so I know exactly what it is. Then I also need a public uh, of type Sprite. And it's got a capital S on that. And I'll call it New Alien. So when I save now, I check out my canvas. I've got two empty slots. One of them will take an image, one of them will take a sprite. So the image comes directly from the space alien and the sprite is going to be this guy. So notice it's two different things. Uh, now, when I click on this, I can say, uh, what is it, space alien? Space alien dot sprite is going to equal new alien. So that's simply how I can just swap out a sprite. All right, really easy stuff. Let's test that, make sure that it works. There we go, now I've got the other guy. Now, uh, effectively, what I also want to do is change the name of the text that's appearing on the um, button. So I'm going to put in some conditionals. So I'm going to say if um, my name is equal to green, then I want my name equals blue. So it's going to be a blue alien next. Take all of that, control and C, control and V, and I'm going to say else if, so that to make sure that they don't both run at the same time. If my name is equal to blue, then my name equals green. Okay, so it's simply just going to flip that around each time that I click. test now. It's green at the moment and then it becomes blue the next time I click. Green, blue, green, blue, etc. Now it only does that the second time that I run and that's because of the ordering of my commands. My commands came after I'd applied the my name. So if I do control X and put this at the top Control V, that part has to run first. Take out this debug.log, we know that it's working, and then it will set the button text text to whatever my name has currently been set to. Now if we try it again, so let's save. Now it starts on green, but the next time I click on it, it goes blue. All right, green, blue, green, blue. Okay. Now. Um, where we're setting our space alien sprite to new alien, well, we need another sprite. Public of type sprite that we'll call old alien. I could have called them blue and green alien actually. And let's save that. Let's just make sure that I'm applying that. So I'm going to drag green alien into there. And now in our script, we can simply switch these over. So where it says space alien sprite new alien, you can do a control X on that one. I only want that to be the new alien if uh, my name is equal to blue. If my name, however, is equal to green, then I want that to be old alien. And that will then simply just switch those over. All right, so really easy stuff. It's all based on conditions. So let's now test this. All right, blue, 
back to green, back to blue, back to green, etc. But now it would be nice if our button actually matches those colours. Uh, now we could effectively go through the button and make the normal colour and the selected colour different, but the selected colour kind of stays when we've clicked on this. So what we need to do effectively is change these colours in script. Okay, now this is called a colour block, this entire section. So that's effectively what we need to change. All right, so first of all, we're going to need three colours. We're going to need a normal colour, highlighted colour, and a pressed colour. In fact, actually, we don't need pressed colour. We need a selected colour. We can ignore pressed colour. It only appears for like a brief second. So let's define some colours. So public and it's going to be of type color and i'll call this um green normal okay public color call it uh, green highlight public color call it uh, green uh, selected I take all three of these, control and C, control and V, and then simply change green to blue for each of these. Okay, so now we're going to get a whole bunch of color selections. So let's just save this. On our canvas, we've now got a whole bunch of color selections. So green normal is going to be green. All right, so let's choose like green. And the hexadecimal for that is 08FF00. So I'm just going to copy that. But just be just be careful is alpha. The alpha is set at zero. So we want to make sure the alpha is at 255. It should show as green with a solid white line underneath it. Green selected is going to be the same color. I'm just going to paste that in there and make sure that my alpha is at 255. The highlighted for green, I'm going to have as, uh, I might have it as this dark blue, I think. Exadecimal code is 0008FF. And once again, the alpha at 255. There we go. Blue normal, however, is going to be blue. So I'll have it around here. 0052FF. And copy that, set the alpha all the way up here, and then the blue selected is going to be the same color, so paste that in alpha up here, and then the clicked button I'm going to have as green. Okay, so just set it as a green alpha all the way up at 255. All right, so we should see those, those button colors change based on which alien is being presented. Now, in order to access that, we first need access to our button. So public of type uh, button that we'll call my button. Now, um, when we click, for example, if it's green, we need to set our uh, color block to the green colors. So what we're going to say is a type of color block that I'm going to call green colors. And I'm going to make that equal my button dot colors. So they're going to get passed into that uh, color block. Now, this is a temporary variable. It's only going to be valid as long as we're inside of these uh, curly brackets. Now, I need to set my individual colors. So I need to say green colors dot normal color is going to equal green normal. Remember, we define that further up here. That's that one. And I'm just going to take, in fact, it might be easier just to manually type it. Uh, green colors dot highlighted color is going to equal green highlight. And then green colors dot selected color is going to equal green selected. Then we need to pass those colors 
back to the my button color. So effectively, we have to reverse what we've done here by saying my button dot colors equals green colors. And that will then set those. All right, now we need to do exactly the same thing for the blue. So let's uh, do a control and C. Ah, now I can actually see that I've done it the wrong way around. I've set those guys to green. Uh, so I'll keep that there. I'll change this to blue colors. Okay, so I want to change this to blue colors and then change all of these names. So that's blue colors, blue colors, blue colors, and blue colors. Could have done a bit of refactoring there, but that's fine. Uh, so now where I get my green normal, I want to change that to blue normal. Where I've got green highlight, I want to change that to blue highlight. Where I've got green selected, I want to change that to blue selected. All right, so we're effectively changing between blue and green. Let's try this now. So in our canvas, we've now got a little slot for the button. That's going to go in there. Okay, uh, now the button itself, when it first starts, it's going to be this orange color. So let's just set it to uh, a nice kind of green color. Okay, so let's, let's check it. So green goes to that yellowy color. When I click on it, it turns blue. All right, which is great. Now when I click on it again, it turns green, blue, green, blue. And you can see those colors change in there based on that color block. Excellent. So you can see how you can really manipulate the UI so easily just using script and very basic coding. And now we want to take a look at the text element. Uh, so under UI, I want to use text, text mesh pro, which instantly gives me a new bit of text. Uh, I want to move this text over to this side. So that I can see it there. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call this name. The name of this character, I might call him Sid the Alien. Okay. Uh, I'm going to increase the width so that it doesn't uh, go down to two lines. All right. So Sid the Alien. And perhaps what I want on this one is maybe, uh, let me see if we can get some glow on this one. Um, I'm not sure I've actually got that option of glow. I've got an underlay. I've got an outline. I could potentially give this an outline. Well, it already is white, but let me see what happens if I were to change the text itself to black. No, I can't see anything. Keep it at white. Um, yeah, all right, I'll just keep it as it is, I think, which is fine. Um, and the font that I want is the Great Vibes. Okay, so I'm just going to make the font size a lot bigger. Sid, the alien. In fact, I'm going to get rid of the alien. Just keep Sid. Okay, so we can see what, what his name is. Now, for the other guy, I might call him... Um, I might call him Leo, I think. So what I want to do here is access some text. So public of type text. Uh, ooh, remember that it's text mesh pro text. So it's TMP underline text. And I'll call it name text. Now under here, if it becomes blue, then I want to say uh, name text equals dot text. I want to access the text element equals um, Leo. Let's uh, click on this. 
and let's put this one in here and let's call it uh, Sid so you can always put it back all right and that's it that's how we change text all right so really easy um, so in the canvas where we have our name text let's drag in name and let's give it a go so that's Sid and then that's Leo Sid Leo okay so extremely easy to change text and any kind of UI element as I say these are the basics all right so everything at the basics is really really easy to do now you might find scripts at the basic level uh, are meant to be extremely easy to read then in terms of functionality they're not necessarily the most functional things that you can get sometimes you are limited because it is meant you know because it, you're trying to present it as basically as possible but the great thing is that anybody who comes to check out this script can read it so easily they can understand everything that's going on you can see how you're changing the colors all the names have been chosen appropriately to make everything seem you know uh, it's common sense Every, everybody knows what it means right um, this is scripting at the basic level so now that we've actually covered a number of scripting elements what we're going to do in the next section is make a basic game using only basic scripting so we're going to use all the things that we've actually learned so far and put an actual practical game together so you're going to see how it works in a real world scenario